A firefighter is running through a burning apartment building. The air is thick with black smoke as burning debris crashes down around him. In the chaos, he's been split up from the rest of his crew. They've probably already exited the structure, and based on the conditions, he probably should too. But just as the firefighter turns to head back down the stairs, he hears something. There are cries coming from a room down the hall. The firefighter runs to the door. There's definitely someone inside. He can hear their voice as they cry for help. I'm coming, the firefighter yells. But when he tries to open the door, it won't budge. He backs up and throws his body against it, again and again and again until finally the door bursts open. A wave of heat and smoke hits the firefighter, but he can see who is crying for help. There, across the room, hiding halfway under the bed, is a young girl. She's clutching a stuffed rabbit and crying with fear. The firefighter takes a step towards her, but he can feel the floor start to give way and has to step back. It will never support his weight. He'll need the girl to crawl to him. It's her only chance. He beckons for the girl to come to him as more flaming debris rains down. The little girl starts to crawl towards him, slowly at first, but then faster. She's almost to him when there's a loud crack. The fireman can only watch as the floor collapses beneath the little girl, and she falls. But suddenly, she stops. The fireman can't believe it. Her shirt has caught on a damaged pipe, and she hangs in the air as her stuffed rabbit is swallowed up in the flames below. The fireman reaches out for the little girl as she extends her hand towards his. They both stretch as far as they can, just a little further. They're almost touching, almost there. Just as their fingertips touch, the rest of the floor gives way, and they both fall. Outside, multiple crews man hoses and fight against the blaze, trying to contain the fire which is quickly getting out of control. There is a cry from one of the teams, and the men start running as a large portion of the building collapses. Was anyone still in there? Where's John? The fire chief asks anyone he can find, but no one has seen him. Just then, in the entrance of the building, a figure appears, silhouetted against the flames. It's John. He steps out of the burning building. His suit looks like it has been completely melted by the flames. Somehow, he's alive, but he's alone. As the other firefighters rush to help him, he looks like he is in a daze. They ask him what happened, if there's anyone else inside who might still be able to make it out, but he can only stare at them. A few weeks later, John is sitting in the firehouse. His fellow firefighters can still hardly believe that he made it out of that inferno unscathed. But while the fire miraculously didn't touch his body, it seems to have made an impression in other ways. He's once again at a table with numerous papers spread in front of him. One of the other firemen from his crew starts teasing him about working on one of his projects yet again. What is it this time? Is he doing his monthly budget again, checking credit card statements for fraudulent charges? John is working on his retirement plan, actually. That fire may have shown him that life can be cut quite short, but it also taught him that it's important to get your life in order so that the time you do spend on this earth is well spent. The fireman is laughing at John's newfound fiscal responsibility when the bell starts to chime. No more jokes, it's time to suit up and get out. The firefighters arrive at another large structure fire. A man rushing out of the building tells them between coughs that there's still people inside. The firemen don't hesitate and head into the building. They search the second floor and see a door with smoke billowing out from underneath it. John checks the door for heat and gives a thumbs up. They open the door and head inside. The smoke is so thick that neither of them can see much of anything. But then, through the smoke, they spot something. A woman is lying on the floor. They both step towards her when a beam comes crashing down from the ceiling. They both leap out of the way, and the fireman barely escapes being crushed. He stands up and asks if John is okay, but no response. He quickly looks around, but he can't see him. It's as if he just vanished. But there's no time to figure out what happened. He scoops up the woman, who coughs as he picks her up. She's still alive. As the fireman exits the building with the woman, she appears to have completely regained consciousness. The chief approaches them, but the fireman can only shake his head as if to say, John didn't make it this time. The woman who was rescued from the fire is in the hospital. The doctors can hardly believe it, but she tells them she's fine, and x-rays of her lungs show that there's nothing wrong at all. It's as if she hadn't just been carried out of a building where multiple civilians and firefighters were killed. The doctor tells her that they'll need to run a couple more tests, but if those come back clear, then he doesn't see any reason to hold her. As he is leaving her room, though, he stops and turns to her with one last thing. She has some visitors. The woman seems confused. As the doctor exits the room, 
a group of several people in dark black suits walk in. They look like FBI or CIA agents, but they don't have any badges. Good afternoon, ma'am. We're from the SCP Foundation. We've been looking for you. As the Foundation agents took this young woman into custody, researchers were already preparing a containment cell for her. Though once she got there, she would have a new name, SCP-069. This anomaly is a humanoid entity, though its exact appearance can vary dramatically thanks to its bizarre ability. Whenever SCP-069 is left alone with a recently deceased person's body, 069 will acquire its exact appearance. And not only will SCP-069 look like the recently expired individual, it will also take on their physical mannerisms, their voice, and even their patterns of speech, allowing it to look and sound exactly like the person who just passed away. In the same moment that it begins mirroring the person, the corpse will also disappear by a process that Foundation researchers have yet to understand. The body vanishes without a trace, leaving only the new SCP-069 instance alive and well in its place. This doppelganger will be virtually indistinguishable from the original, with even DNA and fingerprint tests coming back as a match for the original. Friends and family will have no idea that an anomalous entity has taken their place, since in addition to taking on all of the physical qualities of the deceased person, SCP-069 will also gain their knowledge and memories. They will act exactly as the person did, with only one single difference setting them apart. Those who are around SCP-069 in the days and weeks after its transformation will notice that the person will suddenly start expressing a strong desire to get their life in order, with that vague phrase relating to any number of potential tasks. These can include resolving outstanding obligations in their life, either personal like paying back an owed favor, or financial such as resolving debts or making long-term life plans like opening retirement accounts and updating their last will and testament. They will also often make efforts to visit with extended or estranged family members, rekindle friendships that have been allowed to languish, or other acts of closure, the kind that can build up over a lifetime and are often put off until it is too late. SCP-069 seems to retain no knowledge of its previous impersonations, and it will not carry any memories or abilities from one instance to another, outside of the one recurring desire to make things right in its new form's life. When an identified SCP-069 entity has been asked why it is engaging in this new behavior, it claims to have no ulterior motives besides an overwhelming desire to get their life straightened out since, after all, you never know when an unforeseen injury or death might occur. 069 itself experiences pain, injuries, and death just as a normal human does, but those similarities end at the exact moment they expire. When SCP-069 dies, its body will rapidly decay, turning to dust almost instantly. The Foundation has tried to preserve its body or at least stave off the rapid decomposition, but so far, all attempts have failed. After it has died, SCP-069 will then re-manifest at the site of the most recent human death, regardless of its proximity to where 069 died. There does not appear to be any distance limitation to this ability, and the largest such jump the Foundation has recorded is to a death that was 675 kilometers away from where its previous form died. This anomaly first came into the SCP Foundation's radar after field agents learned of a firefighter who appeared to miraculously survive an extremely deadly building fire, which claimed the lives of two other firefighters and 11 civilians. The firefighter had walked out of the building unscathed, despite his suit and equipment suffering an amount of damage that their wearer should not have been able to survive. Roughly three weeks later, the same firefighter responded to another large building fire. He was lost inside a smoky room, and was presumed to have died, despite his body never being recovered. A single civilian was rescued, and much like the firefighter, appeared unharmed, a virtual impossibility given the extremely smoky conditions from which she was saved. An SCP containment team, Mobile Task Force SHE-3, also known as the Body Snatchers, were sent to the hospital where she was recovering the next day, and SCP-069 was identified and taken into Foundation custody for the first time. Containment of this particular anomaly would prove to be quite tricky though, especially when its abilities were not fully understood. Several years after its initial capture, a guard assigned to SCP-069's cell was killed during a containment breach by another SCP, and the proximity of the guard's corpse to SCP-069 allowed them to take on their form. Though it was quickly discovered that the jump had taken place, and SCP-069 was returned to containment, they remained insistent that the Foundation was making a mistake and imprisoning one of their own. 
Over time, though, their protestations waned, and eventually, SCP-069 became relatively compliant and cooperative with staff. That is, until a huge mistake was made that would necessitate a drastic change to its containment procedures. A junior researcher who was assigned to 069 accidentally let slip that the agent's family had been informed of their untimely death. This seemed to greatly distress 069, and they reacted to the news by attempting to commit suicide. It's unknown what exactly triggered this response, since just being told that they were an imposter did not appear to have this effect in the past. But something about the family learning of the original person's death seems to have a profound impact on SCP-069. Following this event, SCP-069 has been placed on suicide watch, and plans to use other recently deceased SCP Foundation employees as possible targets for its ability have been suspended. SCP-069 continues to live in the form of its former guard, and is housed at Humanoid Containment Site 06-3. It continues to insist that it actually is the deceased agent, and still expresses a desire to get its life in order. Despite looking, sounding, and acting exactly as the former Foundation agent, it is not to be treated as if it is that person, no matter how tempting it may be for former friends and co-workers of the departed to have one last visit. If SCP-069 ever attempts to or is successful in breaching containment, it is to be subdued using non-lethal methods. Should SCP-069 die while in containment, Foundation agents are to closely monitor any reports of incidents where it appears that someone has somehow escaped certain death, a telltale sign that the person is now actually SCP-069. In the meantime, the Foundation will continue to study this strange anomaly, which has been classified as safe, and though we may never fully understand its abilities, perhaps there's something we can learn from it when it comes to second chances. A pair of SCP Foundation researchers open the door of a containment cell and find themselves staring at something unlike anything they've ever seen before. Sitting in the middle of the room is a giant lump that appears to be made of what can only be described as flesh. The two look at each other in disbelief. Just what is this thing? They circle the huge blob, looking it over, wondering what on earth it could be. One of the researchers finally gets the courage to actually feel it. He finds that it's warm to the touch. And does he detect some slight movement? He slowly moves to place his ear against it to listen, but a sudden shudder from the mask sends him jumping back in fright. Just then, the other researcher calls to him from the other side of the sphere. It sounds like he has found something. As he approaches, he too sees what caused his partner to call out. There, in the middle of this tumorous ball, is a door. It's a circular iron hatch, the kind sealed by a valve, and it's open. Now the researchers are really confused. A massive lump of living flesh is strange enough, but why does it have a door? One of the researchers peeks inside. Is that a couch they see? And a table? Does someone live in this thing? Things are getting beyond strange. The two researchers look up at the observation window where their supervisor is watching them. The supervisor does not hesitate. He nods at them, and the researchers know what they must do. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. The researcher who lost winces. He knew that coming to work at the SCP Foundation meant that he would be dealing with some strange, dangerous, and disgusting anomalies. But he never imagined he would have to climb inside a giant orb of meat. His partner opens the hatch all the way and offers a hand to help him. Knowing he has no other option, the researcher steps inside. Inside, the air is hot, thick, and moist, like a cramped gym that's had too many bodies exerting themselves on a warm, humid day. He walks through the short entranceway, and his eyes adjust to the dim light to find that he's standing in the middle of a cozy little room. A single, small lamp on a table is giving off just enough light for him to see that the room is sparsely furnished, with a few pieces including a small couch and a twin bed. Outside, his partner calls to him, asking what he can see. As the researcher turns to answer, the door snaps shut. The valve spins on its own, locking itself tight. Try as he might, the researcher can't get it to budge. He bangs on the door and yells, Is he all right in there? Is everything okay? His only response is a muffled scream from inside the ball of flesh. He keeps pulling at the door, twisting the valve with all of his strength, but it won't move. The sounds of gurgles and wet sloshing come from inside the meaty growth. 
an alarm starts to sound as he strains against the door, exerting himself so hard that he feels like a vein in his head might burst. Suddenly, the valve loosens, and the sudden lack of resistance causes him to fall to the floor. The valve spins on its own, and the door swings open once again. The ball of flesh is quiet once more. The researcher picks himself up off the ground and slowly, carefully, peeks inside. Hello? Are you okay? Is anyone in there? There's no response. That is, until a blast of hot air comes rushing out of the hatch, blowing the researcher's hair back. When it's over, he peeks inside again. His fellow researcher is nowhere to be seen. Inside is the same couch, bed, and table with a small lamp. But there's something new there, too. Across from the couch, where there was nothing before, is a small television. While this may seem strange, it's just another day at the SCP Foundation, where anomalous objects and creatures are studied and contained, including SCP-002, also known as The Living Room. SCP-002 is the designation given to a large, tumorous, fleshy growth. It's roughly spherical, with a circumference just over 15 meters, giving it an estimated volume of around 60 meters cubed. Located on one side is an iron valve hatch, similar to what might be found on an old submarine, which leads into the interior of the ball. Those who step inside are surprised to discover a small room that resembles a low-rent studio apartment, complete with furniture and even a small window. Strangely, the outside of the ball of flesh shows no windows, and indeed no openings at all, save for the iron hatch. The furniture in the room displays no anomalous properties, though examination has revealed that the furniture appears to be constructed of sculpted bone, woven hair, and other biological substances, all coming from human bodies. Analysis of samples taken from the furniture has shown each to be constructed from independent and fragmented DNA sequences, several of which correspond to SCP research personnel who have been lost inside of SCP-002. To date, the living room has been responsible for seven members of staff going missing. At the same time, during the course of its containment at the SCP Foundation, the room appears to have added multiple additional furnishings, including two lamps, a throw rug, a television, a radio, a beanbag chair, three books in an unknown language, four children's toys, and a small potted plant. Tests have been performed using a variety of non-human entities in order to see if they would provoke a similar response from SCP-002 to that of humans. Various lab animals, including those with close DNA to humans such as chimpanzees, have been placed in the room. But so far, all have failed to make the living room react. Human cadavers were also tested, but they too did not produce any effect. It is unknown what causes SCP-002 to engage in its behavior, but whatever process it uses to convert organic matter into furnishings seems to only be triggered by the presence of living human beings. SCP-002 was discovered in northern Portugal following reports of an object falling from Earth's orbit. There in the bottom of a small crater was SCP-002. It was encased in a thick shell of rock, but the anomaly's fleshy exterior could be seen through cracks that were likely created by the impact. A local farmer was the first to spot the object falling to Earth and brought word of what he found to his village. At the same time, a Level 4 SCP Foundation agent stationed in the area detected elevated levels of radioactivity and traced the source back to the crater. An SCP collection squad led by General Mulhausen was dispatched to the impact site and quickly secured the area. Test subjects from the nearby village were recruited for initial analysis of the object, with three men being individually sent inside of SCP-002, all of whom disappeared. Having confirmed this anomaly's deadly properties, General Mulhausen then issued a Level 4A termination order that would apply to any local witnesses in order to ensure that no knowledge of the object reached the outside world. He then oversaw its transport to an SCP containment facility. As Foundation staff prepped SCP-002 for relocation, four members of the security personnel were seemingly mesmerized and drawn inside the object where they too disappeared. This was the first hint that SCP-002 possesses some form of subtle mind control with the ability to influence humans into stepping inside of it. It was after these losses that it was first noticed that the object appeared to grow new furnishings following someone disappearing inside. After these mishaps, 
General Mulhausen ordered all staff to wear hazmat suits when dealing with SCP-002, and following the General's own termination, SCP-002 was placed in containment at the secure facility where it currently resides. Due to the ongoing danger presented by SCP-002, the risk it poses to any who step inside of it, and the mind control abilities it possesses, it has been classified as Euclid. It is to remain connected at all times to a suitable power supply to keep it in a charging mode of some kind, which appears to make it more docile. In the event of a power outage, staff in the immediate area are to be evacuated and the object's containment cell emergency barrier is to be closed, sealing it off from the rest of the site. Once power is re-established, strobing X-ray and ultraviolet lights are to be activated in the containment cell until SCP-002 is returned to its charging mode. Research teams investigating SCP-002 that will come within 20 meters of the object must consist of no fewer than two members. Personnel should also maintain physical contact with one another at all times to confirm that the other is present and not experiencing any feelings of confusion, dull perception, or other forms of bewilderment that may lead to them entering the living room. No personnel at all below a level 3 clearance are allowed inside of SCP-002, and any staff that have contact with the anomaly are to be escorted no less than 5 kilometers away and must undergo a 72-hour quarantine and psychological evaluation. SCP-002 is one of the oldest anomalies in the SCP Foundation database, but remains one of the least understood. Perhaps one day we'll understand what it is, and why it was at one time sitting in the orbit of Earth. Did someone send it here, intending us to one day find it? Did it come here of its own volition? Or did we put it there ourselves, in an attempt to keep it away? A young man tosses and turns in bed. He adjusts his pillow and tries sleeping on his back, his side, his stomach, but nothing works. He rolls over to check the time, 3 a.m. This is the third night in a row he hasn't been able to fall asleep. He feels tired. He wants to sleep. But every time he closes his eyes and sleep starts to creep in, something happens. And suddenly, he's wide awake again. It's as if someone keeps flipping a switch in his brain to awake, and there's nothing he can do to stop it. It's affecting everything in his life. He can't concentrate in class. His work performance goes down the drain. Even his hobbies become completely unenjoyable. All he wants to do is sleep. His friends and family can tell something is wrong. It's as if he has become a different person, and they urge him to go see a doctor. But the doctors tell him there's nothing they can do for him. He's perfectly healthy otherwise. He should try some natural remedies like valerian root and get more exercise. He has no idea how many days he's been awake now. Four, five, maybe more. At this point, the lack of sleep isn't even the worst part. It's the hallucinations. Sometimes they're just a shadow dancing outside of his vision, but others are incredibly vivid, feeling more real than his now dreary life does. He had to stop going to work and class entirely since he can't concentrate for more than a couple of seconds at a time. His friends don't want anything to do with him, and who can blame them? He has uncontrollable mood swings and lashes out for no reason. He's tried every sleep remedy there is. He took the doctor's advice and exercised as hard as he ever has. But with never being able to sleep, he has no energy left. He's becoming a living zombie. He gets up out of bed but loses his balance and collapses to the floor. He tries to get up, but he can't. He'll just lie there for a while. He starts to drift away, and he readies himself for the jolt that always wakes him back up. But this time, it doesn't come. The wave of sleep that starts to wash over him feels different this time, though. It's heavier, more peaceful, and more permanent. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-966, also known as Sleep Killer. SCP-966 is the designation that the SCP Foundation has given to a creature that belongs to a group of anomalous predatory beasts, standing 1.4 to 1.6 meters tall and weighing roughly 30 kilograms. These hairless humanoids have an elongated face, a mouth full of pointed needle-like teeth, and each of their hands has five razor-sharp claws that can be up to 20 centimeters in length. Though unlike humans and apes, 
They are digitigrade, meaning that they walk using only their toes. But you won't be able to see the horrible visage of SCP-966 under normal circumstances, as they are only visible under very specific lighting conditions. They can only be viewed under light that has a wavelength between roughly 700 and 900 nanometers, which is just at the edge of the light spectrum that's visible to humans stretching into what's known as infrared light. The only exception to this is if their skin, muscles, or organs have suffered from second or third degree burns, in which case, the affected areas of their body will show up under a greater spectrum of wavelengths that are visible to the human eye. Though frightening to look at, SCP-966 are actually quite weak physically, with very low muscular density. Their bones are hollow, similar to birds, and while their claws may be incredibly sharp, they are also easily broken, making them unsuited for use in combat. Additionally, they do not rest through sleep, but will, at seemingly random times, stop all movement and fall into a rest period that lasts roughly three to five minutes, after which they are able to resume their normal behavior. With all of these physical shortcomings, how did SCP-966 gain a reputation as such a fearsome hunter? The secret lies in their ability to emit bursts of a previously unknown type of wave. Hunting either alone or in pairs, SCP-966 uses this wave to inhibit its prey's ability to enter any of the restful sleep stages and also stops the ability to micro-sleep. These waves have been observed to be effective at up to 20 meters, though tests have shown that they can be blocked by post-transition metals, of which lead appears to be especially effective. SCP-966 hunts and feeds on medium to large-sized animals, which includes humans, and once their quarry has been targeted by the sleep-inhibiting waves, the effect is permanent with no method having yet been discovered that will allow them to regain the ability to sleep. Experiments have shown that unconsciousness can be induced in other ways, such as with the use of general anesthesia, though these methods have ultimately proven to be ineffective, since although the victim is unconscious, they are still not receiving any of the restful benefits of sleep while in that state. The effects of sleep deprivation on humans, both mentally and physically, are devastating. Symptoms can begin setting in after just 24 hours that can include mood swings, memory issues, and sensory impairment. After two to three days, the body's hormones become deregulated, and bodily functions like hunger, thirst, and temperature fluctuate wildly as cognitive abilities start to dramatically decline. Hallucinations, paranoia, and fits of rage are common, and the risk of death from sleep deprivation increases with each day that passes without sleep. And this is exactly what SCP-966 wants. After surreptitiously sending a burst of sleep deprivation waves at their victim, they will then stalk their prey until lack of sleep finally leads to total incapacitation, at which point SCP-966 consumes them. SCP-966 have proven to be both extremely quiet and agile when hunting. However, they have actually been observed intentionally making threatening noises around their prey presumably to further increase their already elevated stress levels, and potentially hastening their mental degradation. On rare occasions, they will even physically assault their victim to further degenerate their mental and physical health. Some of SCP-966's prey will experience especially intense hallucinations and bouts of rage, which is theorized to be caused by prolonged exposure to multiple instances of their sleep-stopping waves. Why some victims are exposed to multiple waves when a single instance has been shown to be 100% effective is unknown, and it's hypothesized that they may only engage in this behavior when especially hungry, to try and speed up the process. Though others have put forth the theory that SCP-966 may take some perverse form of joy in seeing its victims suffer prior to expiring. Wild instances of SCP-966 have been found across the globe, and while the SCP Foundation has been successful in thinning their numbers, they still exist in high enough numbers to pose a serious threat to humanity. For these reasons, they have been assigned the classification Euclid. Mobile Task Forces IOTA-1 and IOTA-2, codenamed the Dream Hunters and Air Chasers respectively, are continually monitoring for any reports of sudden or violent deaths related to sleep deprivation in order to identify and neutralize the remaining instances of wild SCP-966. Four SCP-966 specimens, three males and one female, have been acquired by the Foundation, and they are currently contained in a 10 by 10 meter room that is lined with lead and equipped with infrared security cameras. 
Each specimen is fed 20 kilograms of meat each month, and in the event that the female specimen gives birth, the new specimen is to be taken for observation and study before being disposed of prior to reaching maturity. Candace Hayes, we have thy confession. A witch as brazen as you shall be burned at the stake. The crowd gathered in the small room bursts into a cheer as the judge hands down the sentence. The accused woman doesn't react, though. She looks neither scared nor afraid, but simply resigned to her fate. No time is to be wasted in carrying out the punishment that the judge has decreed. A pair of constables grab the woman by the arms and take her away. A mob follows along as the woman is led through the town, taunting and jeering, calling her a witch, a wife of Satan, and worse names. She doesn't seem affected by them, though. In fact, she looks as if she can't even see them. Her attention is focused solely on one mysterious woman who walks along with the crowd, and yet somehow seems disconnected, as if she isn't truly there either. The two women maintain eye contact as the constables keep pushing the condemned woman along. They lead the woman outside of town to a tall hill. The ropes binding the woman's hands are cut, and she has just a moment to rub her sore wrists before she is forced to the ground and lashed to a piece of wood as another group tosses the last logs onto a nearby pile. Once she is securely tied down, the constables step away, but then another man wearing a hood approaches. He carries a large club and without hesitation begins beating her legs. The woman's composure finally breaks and she cries in pain from the cracking of her bones. The crowd only cheers louder at the screams from the witch. The beating has left the woman's legs mangled, but this is far from over. The woman, still strapped to the wood, is placed on the pyre, where she hangs like a scarecrow above the combustible material. The judge steps forward out of the screaming mob, carrying a torch. He loudly exclaims that for her crimes, she will be burned until dead. But the judge doesn't step forward. He instead announces that another will have the honor of lighting the flame. Another man steps out of the crowd and takes the torch from the judge. He walks towards the pyre and looks up at the woman. She is exhausted from the beating, but she lifts her head. She doesn't look at the man with the torch, though. She's looking past him, locking eyes with the mysterious woman who walked along with the crowd. The man looks angry, slighted that she won't even meet his eyes in this final moment, and without another moment's hesitation, he tosses the torch onto the pyre. The wood lights instantly, the tinder combusting and turning into a huge roaring fire. The crowd also erupts into even louder cries of celebration as the woman screams from inside the blaze. The man watches as the woman is lost behind the fire and the smoke, and eventually her cries too are hidden behind the crackles and pops of the flames. He doesn't move until the fire has nearly burned itself out. Most of the crowd has left at this point, having gone back to their homes content with the role they played in doing the Lord's work. As the constables pull a charred torso down from the wood and unceremoniously toss it over a steep side of the hill, the man finally turns and starts to walk away, a tear rolling down his cheek. The judge approaches and places a hand on the man's shoulder. There, there, the judge says, attempting to comfort the man. You'll find a new wife soon enough. Hundreds of people were accused of witchcraft in colonial America, and while it is likely that many were falsely accused, there is reason to believe that some were under the influence of, or were themselves, what we now describe as anomalies. And SCP-3998 is just such an example, better known as The Wicker Witch Lives. SCP-3998 is a human cadaver which dates from the late 17th century that is covered in fourth-degree burns and is missing its legs. There is also evidence of extensive blunt force trauma, but it is not known if the beating or the burning was the ultimate cause of death. At some point, the remains were collected and fastened into a scarecrow that is held together with wicker, nails, and wire. While a scarecrow fashioned from a cadaver is rather unconventional, what brought SCP-3998 to the SCP Foundation's attention were its other anomalous attributes. It constantly secretes a flammable liquid from its bones that primarily consists of ethanol and human fat, and every night between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m., the corpse ignites. This fire doesn't cause any damage to the corpse, though, and it is unknown how it produces the flammable liquid or ignites. 3998 does not keep its flames to itself, though. 
It appears that the SCP targets those who have either killed or physically abused a romantic partner, causing them to catch fire as large quantities of boiling ethanol appear in their stomach. Their midsection will eventually melt and then explode, leading to amputation of the lower half of their body. The fire burns both incredibly hot and unnaturally fast and is unable to be put out until SCP-3998 is extinguished. A number of historical documents related to the case have been discovered and made available to Foundation researchers that shed light on SCP-3998, including excerpts from a 17th century diary belonging to a woman who lived near where the cadaver was discovered. In the entries, the woman describes attending the wedding of her neighbors, Aidan and Candace Hayes, though Candace did not seem especially happy with the arrangement. Candace is characterized as someone who likes to keep to herself and who does not conform to the era's idea of a good wife. As a result, it appears that she became the victim of abuse at the hand of her husband. The diarist hypothesizes that Candace has brought this fate upon herself due to her behavior, which may stem from her being under the hold of the devil. In other words, the neighbor believes that Candace is a witch. Others must have had the same suspicion because we also have records of Candace's interview with a Judge William Stoughton, who questioned her about the accusations of consorting with evil spirits. Candace readily admitted to this, though she disagreed that it was in any way evil. She told the judge that the rituals and magics she practiced were not inherently good or bad, and that anyone was capable of using the same tools. She went on to explain that she hated her husband, that she had been forced to marry him, and that he had been nothing but cruel and violent towards her. Candace also mentioned a name, Clovis, that the judge assumed to be the demon that she had made her cursed pact with. Candace appeared to offer no defense or excuses for her actions, and the judge sentenced her to die by burning at the stake, with her husband, Aiden, being the one to light the fire. The story of this witch trial was typical of the time, and that likely would have been the end of what we know about SCP-3998. But another historical document was located that has truly given a new perspective to this anomaly. A sealed letter found in the cellar of a home that is addressed to Candace, though it appears to have been written after her death. The letter is from her secret lover, and describes how they collected Candace's burnt bones from the bottom of the hill before binding them together with wicker and wire. The letter then describes how Candace's husband has recently restocked his own home with gin, which is well known to be extremely flammable. The letter ends with an affirmation of the writer's eternal love for Candace and is signed, Clovis. But perhaps the best information we have about the origin of SCP-3998 comes from an obscure local tale that was passed down orally for years and eventually documented on an urban legend website. The legend tells of a woman who promised her soul to a she-devil who taught her magic but also offered companionship. When her husband found out, he contacted the local authorities and had the woman arrested. She was tried, her legs were broken, and she was hung up like a scarecrow before being burned alive. Her body was dumped off the side of a mountain, but the she-devil collected her bones and gave her life again. The need for revenge burned in the woman's heart, so in the middle of the night, she doused herself in her husband's gin, set herself on fire once more, and fell upon him as he slept, burning him alive so he could suffer the way that she did. SCP-3998 is currently held in a secure holding locker in Site-34 that is fireproofed and vacuum sealed to prevent it from igniting. Every morning at 9 a.m., 3998 and its locker are cleaned to remove the secretions of flammable liquid. D-Class personnel who have been convicted of domestic abuse crimes are to always be kept at the site to ensure that they are the targets of SCP-3998, which when it's not allowed to ignite, will result in them only feeling mild discomfort in their head and chest rather than spontaneous combustion. Due to its relatively easy method of containment, SCP-3998 has been classified as safe. However, recent developments have caused the Foundation to rethink this classification. Despite 3998 being securely contained, the number of arson-related homicides in the state of Massachusetts have actually increased following containment with many showing the same damage to their body as would be expected in a victim of SCP-3998. And while it may be that these are the result of a yet uncaught serial killer who simply happens to employ similar methods of killing their victims, a recent re-examination of the SCP-3998 corpse has revealed more troubling details. The body of SCP-3998 does not belong to Candace Hayes, and in fact appears to be a male who was in his 30s at the time of his death. 
Following these new revelations, reclassification of SCP-3998 to Euclid is pending. Whether SCP-3998 is the body of Candace's husband Aiden, forced to endure an eternal punishment of burning again each and every night, or if it's some other unfortunate victim of a violent and painful death, is unknown. As is the ultimate fate of Candace and Clovis, but with the deaths that would appear to be attributable to SCP-3998 showing no signs of stopping despite containment, it can only be assumed that the Wicker Witch lives. The explorer slashes his way through the jungle, using his large machete to hack through the thick undergrowth. He suddenly stops and turns around. Which way was it again? His local guide answers, but he must wait for him to finish and his research assistant to translate. He says to continue straight, it's just another hundred yards or so. The gentleman explorer offers a quick nod, before turning to resume cutting his way through the forest. The guide was right though, because after a short way, the dense jungle suddenly opens up, giving way to a clearing that reveals one of the most incredible things the explorer has ever seen. Just ahead of him, rising out of the forest, is a massive ancient stone temple. A huge step pyramid of solid stone, intricately carved and covered with elaborate statues. The colossal structure looks like it has been abandoned for centuries if not longer, with nature having done its best to reclaim the stone and cover the pyramid in vines and other plants. The team approaches the temple, but stops in front of a stone monument that stands in front of it. The explorer traces its carved lines with his finger, knocking the dirt away to reveal its weathered pictograph. It appears to depict a sort of creature, but with large spread wings instead of arms. Perhaps a kind of ritualistic garb? The explorer says to his assistant. The assistant hastily scribbles in her notebook, trying to document everything she can. Yes, this is definitely a priest-like figure of some kind. Maybe a leader of this temple thanks to the connection he shares to their… The explorer's musings are interrupted by his guide, who he angrily spins around to face. Yes, what? What is it? His research assistant translates for him as usual. He says that we should go no further, that it's too dangerous. Nonsense, replies the explorer. We came all this way, and who knows what fantastic treasures await us inside. Historical treasures, I mean. Artifacts. Treasures of knowledge, of course. Of course, replies his assistant, before following her boss as he starts making his way up the step pyramid, as the guide holds true to his stated intentions and waits near the edge of the jungle. The two of them walk through an entrance that leads into a long, dark hallway. With only torches to light their way, it's impossible to see just how deep it runs into the temple. The explorer stops to examine the walls, which are covered in even more carvings. He can see that there are complicated geometric patterns, but also many more depictions of the same winged creature that was on the monument outside. Here though, the creatures are depicted in moments of action. They appear to be running, chasing, reaching out and grabbing for… people. They are shown attacking them, picking them up, carrying them away to… Right where the pictograph story should reveal its climax is a chunk of missing wall. It must have fallen off at some point. Ah, oh well, the explorer declares before moving on to explore more of the temple. His assistant doesn't follow though. She spots several pieces of stone on the floor underneath the missing panel and kneels down to get a closer look. She begins to gather them together, rearranging the various pieces back into their original form. Meanwhile, the explorer's attention has been caught by something else. On the other side of the hall is a statue of a tall, proud warrior, and in his hand he clutches a large bejeweled spear, the gemstones adorning it sparkling in the torchlight. The explorer reaches out and grips the spear's handle. He begins to pull, perhaps being a little rougher than one should with an ancient artifact, but he wants this fabulous jeweled piece, and even more than the spear itself, he wants the acclaim it will bring him back home. As the explorer pulls on the spear, his research assistant moves the final piece of the broken wall carving into position. She holds her torch over it to get a better look, and she gasps. The winged creatures are carrying people away, but that isn't the end of the story. They are bringing them somewhere, and she can even see now that they are being presented to an even bigger winged creature. It's a monster. A monster that is feeding on the people. The assistant turns to tell the explorer what she has found, and just as she does, she watches as he is finally able to rend the spear loose from the statue's grip. The statue finally letting go causes him to fall backwards to the ground, where he lies marveling at the beautiful jeweled spear in his hands. Look out! yells his assistant. The explorer doesn't notice that the statue is precariously rocking back and forth, and he rolls out of the way just before it crashes down right where he was lying and admiring the spear. Are you okay? she asks as she rushes over. I think so, he tells her. 
Just a little bump on the head. Nothing that can't be fixed up by a good... By a good what? She asks, but he seems distracted by something behind her. By a good... By a good... By God, what is that? He points, and the research assistant turns to see something emerging from a hole in the wall where the statue once stood. It's one of the creatures from the wall carvings. A bizarre half-man, half-lizard, with wings instead of arms. Though there's no flesh at all, the creature is completely made of bone. The two of them both scream at the skeletonized half-human, and the creature screams right back at them, emitting a shrill, high-pitched squeal. Suddenly, more of the creatures begin to emerge from the hole in the wall, with others crawling out of previously unseen and unnoticed holes in the walls and ceiling. The creatures rush towards them, blocking their way out of the temple, and the pair have no choice but to run further down the darkened hallway. As they run, more of the creatures emerge from holes in the darkness, screaming at them and grasping at them with the sharp claws on the end of their wings. As they round a corner, one reaches out and grasps the explorer's ankle, causing him to trip and fall hard onto the stone floor. His assistant rushes to his aid, but as she is helping him up, two more of the creatures appear behind her and envelop her in their bony, winged arms. The explorer stands up and stabs at one of them with the jeweled spear as they drag her into a dark hole, but a third tears it from his hands. With more still coming down the hallway behind him, the explorer has to run. The hallway in front of him looks to have collapsed at some point in the past, and he has no choice but to enter one of the dark tunnels that has been carved into the rock. The narrow tunnel winds back and forth, and the explorer is unsure of where he is going or what his plan is. He rounds a bend, and the tunnel opens up into a gigantic room. The ceiling must be over a hundred feet high and he can't see the furthest walls, with the only light emitted by his torch and a dim beam of sunlight coming down through a hole high up in the ceiling. He notices, too, that it has suddenly gone quiet. He turns and looks back at the tunnel he has just emerged from, and notices that the sound of the horrible creatures that were chasing him has ceased. The explorer hears something coming from deeper in the giant room and turns back, peering into the darkness. There, in a single beam of light, he sees one of the winged creatures, but it is moving strangely, as if it isn't walking, but floating up into the air. And that's because it isn't walking. As it gets closer, the explorer can see that the winged creature is stuck on the tooth of a giant, monstrous mouth. The huge winged creature emerges from the darkness into the beam of light, tossing back its giant head to consume the creature that was stuck in its teeth, its bones loudly cracking in its mouth. Now, in the light, the explorer can see that the monster, which itself must be hundreds of feet long, is a huge flying lizard of some kind, or at least it was at one time, since now the majority of its body is made only of bone. What scraps of flesh are left hang off in rotten ribbons. The monster opens its mouth and roars at the explorer. Its foul breath smells like a mausoleum opening up, hitting the explorer in the face. The explorer tries to run, but the monster swipes out with a bony wing that still has a few blackened strips of leathery skin on it and knocks into the ground. He is pinned to the floor with a huge spiny claw as the creature opens its mouth, roaring again before moving its head down to start feasting on its meal. The explorer closes his eyes, bracing himself to be eaten alive. When the creature suddenly lets out an ear-piercing scream, the explorer opens his eyes to see the jeweled spear sticking out of one of the few spots of flesh remaining on the creature's clawed foot, and gripping the shaft is his assistant. She looks a little worse for wear, but she's alive. She offers him a hand to help him up. They need to get out of there. But first, the explorer pulls the spear from the monster's claw, the two start running, doing everything they can to avoid the monster as it claws and swipes at them. They spot an illuminated opening at the other end of the vast room, and with no other option, start heading towards it. As they get closer, they can see it's just what they needed. Daylight. Escape. They both slide to a stop at the cusp of the opening, nearly tumbling over the edge. On the other side, the tunnel opening up out of the side of the temple gives way to nothing but air and a drop of hundreds of feet down to the jungle below. They turn to see the monster still rushing towards them, and without time to think any longer, they both jump, just seconds before the creature snaps its bony jaws in the place where they were standing. It's too big to fit anything more than its mouth out the door, and it howls and screams as they fall through the air before crashing into the ground below. The assistant slowly opens her eyes to see someone. It's their guide. He is cradling her head and asking if she's okay. She sits up, dazed and more than a little bruised from her fall. She asks the guide where the explorer is, if he's all right, and the guide lowers his eyes, looking as though he'd rather not answer. He points next to them without looking, and the assistant turns to see the explorer lying on the ground a few feet away from them, his body impaled on the jeweled spear. 
History is full of tales and legends about gods, monsters, and everything in between. But not all of these are just stories. And in fact, sometimes the reality is even more terrifying than what we could envision. And that is exactly the case when it comes to SCP-4959, also known as the Teotihuacan Pterodactylactery. SCP-4959 is a huge creature that resembles a pterosaur, which were flying reptiles that existed during the Mesozoic era. While pterosaurs have been extinct for millions of years, SCP-4959 is very much alive, or at the very least, animate. This massive anomaly, whose wingspan stretches approximately 50 meters, is in a living state of decomposition, with roughly 70% of its flesh having rotted or otherwise fallen away, leaving only small patches of skin and decaying tissue clinging to its bones. The flesh that does remain shows no signs of further decomposition though, as if it is permanently locked into this specific stage of advanced decay. Tests of 4959's flesh have shown no apparent abnormalities, save for a slightly higher than expected concentration of iridium. Its eyes are no longer present, but the eye sockets somehow shine with a bright green light, though the source of this luminescence is unknown. When angered, the creature also emits a multicolored corona of fire from its wings, skull, and neck. SCP-4959 was discovered in a gigantic chamber beneath the Temple of the Feathered Serpent in Teotihuacan, Mexico. A number of tunnels connect to the chamber, and these too are anything but empty. Lurking within the temple's many twisting passages are entities that have been designated SCP-4959-A. These humanoid-sized creatures appear to be constructed of various human and pterosaur bones, creating an all-new creature that is an amalgamation of both. The bones are connected to a central stone-like heart, but it is unknown if this heart was carved from stone, or if it was at one time a real heart that turned to stone through a process of ossification, nor is it fully understood just how the bones are connected to it or stay together. The 4959-A entities also have a number of varying adornments on their bodies which can include strips of decayed fabric, feathers, and precious stones that resemble those worn by the indigenous people who resided in the area many centuries ago. SCP-4959 is carnivorous, though it is unknown if it requires or simply desires to feed. Regardless, it seems to be the task of the SCP-4959-A entities to bring it meals, since the 4959 creature itself is too large to leave its chamber beneath the temple. The hallways and passages that originally connected the temple to the chamber housing SCP-4959 have all collapsed, and the only tunnels now leading to it were most likely dug into the rock and earth by the 4959-A entities. They search through these tunnels, most often working at night, looking for small animals like birds and lizards, but also occasionally finding a larger animal or even a human who has somehow found themselves inside. They will then bring their live prey directly to the giant pterosaur, offering them up as both a meal and a sacrifice. SCP-4959 will then proceed to eat the prey whole, sometimes consuming the 4959-A entity at the same time as well. The temple itself is covered in carvings and murals that give numerous hints as to the origin of SCP-4959. While it is unknown just how it got there, it appears as though the local people discovered the creature within its chamber and regarded it as an avatar of their feathered serpent god, or perhaps another unknown deity. A temple was constructed at the site, and they soon began making sacrifices to the god creature that lived beneath, starting with small animals but then progressing to human sacrifices on important holy days. There is also something else shown in the murals that looks to be of great importance. It seems as though SCP-4959 possessed a sort of heart, which is depicted as a large gemstone, described as being red as blood and bright as the rising sun. This gemstone was previously housed at the pinnacle of the temple, though its current location is unknown. Following intense study of the site by SCP Foundation historians, a narrative was pieced together that may explain at least some of what happened there. It seems as though there was an uprising within the local population in roughly the 6th century AD. A conflict had arisen amongst the people as to whether this really was a god or something else, something evil. Those who doubted the deific origins of SCP-4959 wrested control of the temple and journeyed into its depths to attempt to kill the creature. The many scorch marks on the wall are a testament to the battle that likely took place, and while they suffered many losses, it appears as though they were at least able to seal the chamber shut. It is currently unknown what became of the great jewel on top of the temple after this, but its location is of great interest to the Foundation given that it may well be the source of SCP-4959's longevity. SCP-4959 has been classified as Euclid, and it continues to be contained within the chamber beneath the Temple of the Feathered Serpent. 
though all of the tunnel entrances leading into it have been blocked by reinforced gates. If new ones are discovered as the result of SCP-4959-A's continued tunneling, they too are to be gated and sealed. Once per week, a large live animal, most often a cow, is deposited down a shaft that leads directly to the chamber, and so far this seems to be keeping SCP-4959 content to stay within its tomb. Just what is SCP-4959, and what are the half-man, half-pterosaur creatures who serve it? Are they former human sacrifices, now destined to live in eternity in servitude to their master? If SCP-4959 was a god at one point, the fact that we are now the ones responsible for feeding it and keeping it happy means that in a sense, we are the ones serving it now. It's a quiet day in a small American town. It's warm, with a slight breeze. A calm, simple Sunday, just like so many others. Very few people set their alarms, and most are still asleep at 8 a.m. It's the kind of town where everyone knows and trusts everyone else. After all, what are good neighbors for? While his wife still sleeps back in their modest home, a retired man in his mid-sixties decides to start the day off right. With a rod in one hand and a tackle box in the other, he makes his way down the side of a grassy embankment towards his favorite fishing spot along the local river. He's even got a pair of neatly cut sandwiches in an old-fashioned metal lunch pail, the picture of small-town bliss. But something he sees stops him in his tracks. Something large, floating in the water. He freezes. He wants to write it off as driftwood or some trash that someone has thrown into the river, but in his heart of hearts, he knows better than that. What's floating in the water is a human corpse. Not long after, the local sheriff's department is on the scene, dredging the body out of the water. It's about as small and underfunded as you can expect for a group of police officers from a place where nothing ever seems to happen. There hadn't been a murder in this quaint little burg in years. When they turn over the body, it isn't hard to make a positive ID. The pallid, water-bloated face of a well-known local man stares up at them with blank, dead eyes. Some in attendance gasp at the sight of it. It had been years since the last murder in town, but when that last murder had occurred, the prime suspect had been this very same man. Ten years prior, he had been a successful local mechanic, but that all changed when his wife turned up dead in a field, her face caved in by some kind of heavy bludgeoning instrument. It was a brutal crime, the most horrific the town had ever seen. Reporters traveled in from all over the state to cover it, and that's when the web of secrets tied around this one tragic incident began to truly unravel. It was an open secret in town that the man and his wife weren't exactly on the fondest of terms. He was known for having affairs with women half his age. Rumor had it that his wife was tired of being betrayed and humiliated by her good-for-nothing philandering husband and was finally going to break it off. With the knowledge of his infidelity being so public, she'd take him for all he was worth in divorce court. And it wasn't long after these rumors began that she turned up dead. Soon fingers were pointed, most of them, naturally, in the man's direction. He lawyered up and denied every charge, but in the court of public opinion he'd already been convicted. That, however, was the only court he'd ever be convicted in. Despite the wealth of circumstantial evidence, there wasn't enough to convict him of his wife's killing. He was acquitted of all charges and went free, despite his reputation in town taking a severe dive. In the next few years, he'd marry one of his very young mistresses, and the news story would fade away back into the darkness of small-town rumors and hearsay. The murder of his wife would remain forever unsolved. With all the context in mind, the fishermen, a few locals, and the handful of police officers stare down at the dead face of the man, his soaked body sprawled out on the riverbank. A police deputy uses a gloved hand to tilt his head upward slightly, revealing the long, deep wound in his throat, carved so deep it cuts to bone. His throat had been slashed, and whoever had done it had been extremely thorough. The identity of the victim had been confirmed, as had the method of murder. Only one question remained. Who murdered him? Hours later, across town, a man wakes up alone in bed after a long, refreshing sleep. His young wife of five years went downstairs a few hours before to do some chores and cook breakfast, leaving him to his rest. He rubs the sleep from his eyes and yawns. It's a sunny day outside. How wonderful. And he can smell breakfast cooking downstairs. He smiles, gets up, dresses, and makes his way down the stairs at a leisurely pace. He can hear his wife humming in the kitchen. As he passes the threshold, he calls her name, and she freezes up. Her body shakes slightly. Is that fear. He doesn't understand. He steps closer. 
Suddenly, she turns and screams at him, like he's an intruder wearing a ski mask and holding out a knife. He tells her that it's just him, that everything is fine. He begs her to explain what's going on. Instead, she asks what he's doing in her house and threatens to call the police. He has no idea what's going on. He takes another step forward, and she reacts severely. His young wife grabs the handle of her frying pan and swings it, hitting him as sausages and hot oil fly through the air. He shrieks in a mix of pain, shock, and pure terror before running out of the room. What is happening? Has his wife lost her mind? He needs to get help immediately. He rushes out of his house, but when he reaches the street outside, he finds no safety or comfort, only confused, judgmental stares from his supposed neighbors. They all turn to look at him with the exact same expression as his wife, a look that says, Who are you? As he continues to run, calling for help and fighting back the pain of his oil-scalded skin, he just gets more of those same stares from everyone he encounters. They look at him like he's some kind of raving madman, not someone who'd just been the victim of a random and brutal domestic assault. And yet, back at his home, his wife is already calling the local police to tell them about the stranger who'd just broken into her house and tried to attack her. The sheriff's department deputy on the other end of the line can't believe what he's hearing. A man turns up dead in the local river, and before they can even give his wife the news, she's calling to report that a stranger had tried to attack her in her own home. Could it be any more obvious that this stranger was the one behind her husband's murder? Given that everyone knows everyone in a town like this, it stands to reason that her husband's killer and his wife's home invader must have come from out of town, perhaps a drifter or someone her husband had owed money to. Given the kind of person he was, it was no surprise that he'd burned some kind of bridge badly enough that someone out there would want him dead and act on that desire. Case closed. All that was left to do now was catch this violent madman and bring him to justice before he could hurt anyone else. What kind of justice would they give him exactly? Well, they could decide on the particulars later. As the man continues his frantic run across town, searching in vain for somebody, anybody to come to his aid, rumors begin to spread through town. After all, in a place where everyone knows everyone, people have a tendency to talk. It doesn't take long for half of the town to hear about the local man who'd been found dead in the river with his throat slashed open, that the same maniac that killed him had made an attempt on his young wife's life and she just barely managed to fight him off, that the murderer had come in from out of town and that now he was running through the streets, babbling like a psychopath. It doesn't take long for a consensus to form. It's clear that, if left to his own devices, this outsider will only hurt more people. Who will it be next? It could be any of them. The townsfolk feel afraid, upset, unsafe, but most of all, they feel paranoid. The shadow of the maniac seems to be lurking around every corner. If they want to keep themselves safe and avenge the death of the poor man in the river, they'll need to take justice into their own hands, or this intruder could completely upend their town's quiet life. It's the only way. They unlock their gun safes and arm themselves with shotguns, handguns, and rifles. Those without guns grab bats, hammers, and knives. Some grab shovels and pitchforks from their tool sheds. This loose maniac may be dangerous, but they have numbers on their side. Together, they'll find him and give him what he deserves. The man is still running through the streets, in pain, wondering where everyone has gone. His life is falling apart around him, and he doesn't even know why. Is this all a nightmare? Is he going insane? Before long, he can hear footsteps. People are approaching in groups, yelling, chanting. He sees a crowd turn a nearby corner and stare. Guns, knives, literal pitchforks and torches. Wide, bulging eyes and born teeth. Someone points at him and barks, There he is! Get him! That's when he realizes that, for some reason, these maniacs have it in for him too. He turns tail and begins to run. He hasn't gone insane. Everyone else has. He can hear the thundering of their many footsteps chasing him. He ducks and screams as gunshots ring out, whizzing past him. Some even throw rocks. All these people. This isn't fear, this is pure, undiluted rage. They want to kill him in the street in broad daylight. He hears some of them screaming, Murderer! Murderer will get you! In his terrified mind, he wonders, Is this what this is all about? His first wife? He'd been acquitted, it was so many years ago. Why would they all turn on him? Why now? It's... Relief swells and washes over him when he sees a police cruiser making its way towards him from the other end of the street. They'd save him from these bloodthirsty maniacs. The car comes to a stop, and a pair of familiar police officers step out. They seem oddly calm given the situation. The man approaches, trying to plead with him through a throat racked by pain, exhaustion, and terror. The mob is hot on his heels now. He needs help. He desperately needs help. But as he tries to form the words, he gets a hard lesson in the fact that these police officers are the wrong people to come to for that. 
The one closest to him slides the baton out of his belt and strikes the man across the face. His face feels a sudden explosion of pain as his cheekbone shatters. Before he can even register what's going on, the other officer strikes the back of his leg with his baton, and he crumbles to the ground. The two of them begin beating him relentlessly while he begs for mercy through broken teeth, and it's not long until the rest of the mob catches up and surrounds him. With a final strike to the face, everything goes black. When he opens his eyes, it's nighttime, and he can feel something constricting his wrists and neck. Heavy ropes cut into his skin. His hands are bound, and there's a noose around his neck, the other end tied to a branch of a tree above him. His feet teeter precariously on a stool below. The rope has no slack. He's surrounded by the townspeople, all armed and staring hatefully at him. The only light comes from their burning torches. The sheriff stands at the front of the crowd, his weeping wife standing next to him. With a stony face, he dictates that, for the crime of murder, he has been found guilty and is sentenced to hang by the neck until he is dead. His eyes widen one last time in pure panic as the sheriff holds up a photo of the dead man pulled from the river. What? No, there must be some kind of terrible mistake. I didn't kill that man. I am that man. I am. I swear. Please. But before he can even form the words, his own wife steps forward and kicks out the stool from under his feet. While this story of fear, paranoia, mob mentality, and unspeakable violence may seem as sadly natural and human as breathing air, the spark that ignited this tinderbox was decidedly inhuman. This is SCP-3852, also known as Small Town Justice. First, meet SCP-3852-1. No matter what your gut feeling may be, I assure you that you do not recognize him. He's an unidentified male corpse, and also an intrinsic factor in the SCP-3852 phenomenon. There are many SCP-3852-1 instances, and all of them are physically and biologically identical. And if ever you encounter one of them, unless the SCP Foundation can intervene in time, something terrible will happen. To put it simply, one of these unidentified corpses will manifest within the bounds of a small town or village typical with a population of over 2,000 people on the East Coast or in the Midwest of the United States. Upon someone seeing the SCP-3852-1 corpse, the SCP-3852 phenomenon will begin. Despite having no internal or external injuries in an objective sense, the victims of its anomalous effects will believe that it is a person from their town who has been recently murdered, despite the fact that this victim is very much alive in town. While initially it was believed that the selection of the victim, dubbed SCP-3852-2, was entirely random, as more and more SCP-3852 incidents popped up since the first was recorded in 1978, a pattern began to emerge. It was discovered that the victims were all people who were believed to have committed some serious or repeated crimes in the past, but who were acquitted or otherwise cleared of charges. But when the phenomenon begins, a frightening switch occurs. While the body will take on the identity of the victim for a number of the township's citizens, the actual victim will become a depersonalized stranger, an outsider, someone to be looked upon with active suspicion that soon grows into paranoia and, eventually, uncontrollable rage and bloodlust. But the fury of the mob being directed at one person is one thing. A town being dragged into what seems like an outright civil war is quite another. The mob will arm themselves and go on the hunt for the accused. During the process, if anyone in town attempts to stop them, such as when individuals try to stand up on behalf of the accused, encouraging the mob to exercise caution and approach the situation rationally, as happens in many SCP-3852 events, they too will become perceived differently. It is estimated that between 11 and 27 percent of the affected community will not be swayed to join the vigilante group, and when they refute the accusations, they will be accused of trying to impede the course of justice. When the violence eventually breaks out though, as it always does, they will not be spared. When the victim that started it all is finally found, they will be violently executed, at which point the townsfolk will all begin behaving normally and life will resume once more as if nothing ever happened. In the aftermath, People will give inconsistent accounts of what occurred, but none will experience any long-term traumatic effects from taking part in or witnessing the violence. Since the phenomenon was first noted back in 1978, the SCP Foundation has recorded 16 different SCP-3852 incidents, some of which have been appended to the official files for expository purposes. One such event, labeled EV-3852-07F3T, is the very first that the Foundation encountered. 
During this 3852 event, which occurred in a small town in Indiana, 368 people were brought under the thrall of the anomaly's effects when the SCP-3852-1 body was encountered in the town square just after sunrise and was identified as belonging to a 28-year-old local unemployed man named Glenn. It didn't take long for the citizens to turn on the still-living Glenn, causing the poor young man to try and flee from the hundreds of people baying for his blood. He was eventually overtaken by the townsfolk while trying to cross a river and escape from the town. He was pulled from the river and beaten viciously. He was then dragged back into the town square and hanged for his perceived crime of murdering himself. The SCP Foundation managed to recover the anomalous SCP-3852-1 corpse before questioning the remaining townsfolk and administering amnestics. An even worse event occurred 18 years later in Ohio, recorded as EV-3852-15C1K. This time, 572 people were affected by SCP-3852 when the body of a controversial local man named Hector was discovered in a nearby schoolyard. Hector was a former factory worker until he was involved in a drunk driving incident which resulted in another driver dying and left Hector paralyzed from the waist down. When the body was found, suspicion of course immediately fell upon the real Hector for the crime. When roughly 23% of the community objected to these accusations, they also became targets of the violent mob intent on taking Hector's life out of their twisted sense of justice. When later interviewing one of the mob's ringleaders, a 52-year-old named Matthew Escott, the Foundation discovered that neither him nor any of the other mob members noticed the strange coincidence that Hector's killer was also a paraplegic man of about the same size and build as Hector. As predicted, nobody involved seemed to carry any guilt or even full awareness of what they'd carried out in pursuit of justice. Hector and those who were attempting to defend him were chased into an abandoned barn on the edge of town for a final standoff. The mob dragged out Hector and his defenders and brutally murdered them all. MTF Epsilon 6, also known as the Village Idiots, a group specializing in small town anomalies, was called in to retrieve the SCP-3852-1 body and clean up the mess in the aftermath. Incidentally, a video of the carnage was somehow leaked onto the video sharing website YouTube some years later, causing a containment fiasco for the Foundation. The investigation into the cameraman who filmed and presumably uploaded the video is ongoing and any information you may have into their identity should be reported to the nearest Foundation agent so that they can be properly terminated debriefed. SCP-3852 is an incredibly insidious anomaly, because even in the most desirable scenario possible, at least one person is doomed to die. In order for the town to be pacified and released from the anomalous effects of SCP-3852, the victim designated SCP-3852-2 must be neutralized. There simply appears to be no other way. When the village idiots are dispatched to a town in the thrall of SCP-3852, they are under strict instructions to execute the SCP-3852-2 individual as quickly as possible and distribute amnestics in order to avoid any additional or unnecessary bloodshed before collecting the SCP-3852-1 body and bringing it back for containment with the others at a secure Foundation site. Naturally, the SCP Foundation remains on the lookout for strange, hostile activity arising in small towns for fear that it could be another SCP-3852 incident unfolding. There is no way of predicting where the anomaly will strike next, given that anywhere with a population over 2,000 on the East Coast or in the Midwest is vulnerable to its influence. As such, it has been given the Keter class to reflect the challenges it poses to reliable containment. The fact that SCP-3852 seems to attack people with some prior history of accused crime does nothing to narrow down this roster either. After all, every small town, no matter how idyllic, holds dark secrets. SCP-3852 just provides a way to bring those secrets into the light. The house is small, but cozy. When the realtor showed it to her, she couldn't help but notice all the flaws. The chipped paint on the door frame, the missing shingles on the roof, the cracks along the kitchen walls, even the dented old mailbox out front. But even with all those imperfections, she can't help but feel this little house is calling to her. It's where she's meant to be. This will be a home for her. The woman knows, deep in her heart, that this is what she needs to start over. It's not easy. As she moves her things into the new house, she can't help but think about her failed relationship. Every piece of furniture, every knick-knack, reminds her of her old girlfriend. She unloads a heavy box from the back of her car, but she trips over the curb as she turns toward the house. She falls, and the contents of the box spill all over the sidewalk. Their old photo albums. 
She quickly shoves them back into the box, doing her best to avoid looking at them. But one photo, an old vacation snapshot of her and her girlfriend visiting Niagara Falls, catches her eye as it falls out of an album. She bites her lip and wills herself not to tear up as she pushes it back into the box. How can two people who were once so close grow so far apart? The rest of the day passes in a haze. There's lots to do, what with arranging the furniture and calling up all the utilities. By the end of the day, she's exhausted and thankful to fall into bed. As she gradually drifts off to sleep, she muses on her situation. Today was the hardest day, she tells herself. Every day is only going to get easier from here on out. Time heals all wounds. The next day, she rises early. The sun is shining, birds are chirping. As she walks into her new kitchen to brew a pot of coffee, she's overcome with a sudden surge of good feelings. This house has so much potential. She could learn to live here. She could find a new love here. The world is her oyster, and she's ready for anything. Yes, she tells herself, all I needed was a good night's sleep. Now, she feels totally revitalized. A little while later, she hears the mail truck arrive and depart. Looking out the window, she sees that the delivery person has shoved the little aluminum flag into the upright position, indicating that she has mail. She ties her bathrobe around her waist and, still cradling a mug of steaming coffee in her hands, walks to that battered black mailbox at the end of the walkway. That's the first thing that ought to go, she mumbles to herself as she imagines all her plans to redecorate the house. Maybe she'll get one of those fun mailboxes that come in the shape of a wacky animal or a birdhouse. Something different, something eye-catching. Her old girlfriend never let her do anything fun. She pulls open the mailbox and pulls out a stack of envelopes. Still thinking about the possibilities for a new mailbox, she quickly shuffles through the letters, scanning the return addresses with little interest. It's mostly junk mail. That's no surprise. She just moved in, so most of her friends don't know her new address yet. But there's one letter at the bottom of the pile that has no return address. Huh, that's weird, she says. It's probably just more junk mail. She knows that some advertisers don't leave return addresses as a way to pique a recipient's interest and trick them into reading their sales pitches. Nevertheless, she's intrigued enough to tear it open. To her surprise, inside is a handwritten letter. Hello, says the letter. I couldn't help but notice you today. I'm really excited to see a new face in the neighborhood. I hope you enjoy your stay here. Maybe we could meet later? See ya! The woman blinks in confusion. This must be a welcome letter from one of her new neighbors, but since it's not signed, she really has no way of knowing which one. It's a little odd, but, well, she's sure that the letter writer must have had good intentions. She pushes the red aluminum flag back into its reclining position, folds the mysterious letter under her arm with her other mail, and retreats back into her new house. Imagine her surprise when, the next day, she finds another letter in her mailbox. Hi again, it says. I saw that you read my letter yesterday. I'm so glad. I was afraid that you wouldn't like me, but now I see that we're going to be great friends. Maybe you'd like to get coffee together sometime? XOXO. P.S. I really like you. Okay, now this is getting a little pushy. That first letter was friendly, if a little awkward, but this one almost sounds like someone is trying to solicit her for a date. She's in no mood for that. Even if she wasn't still hurting from her breakup, she didn't know this mysterious letter writer. Where did they get the nerve to ask her out? Angrily, she crumples up the new letter and throws it directly into the trash. She looks across the hedge, peering into the neighbor's yards. In the yard to her left, a middle-aged man pushes a lawnmower across the grass. In the yard to her right, two old women are gossiping at the fence. She feels suddenly exposed as she realizes that the letters could be coming from anyone in the neighborhood. She hopes that maybe if she ignores it, the message will be clear. She quickly scurries back into her house and slams the door shut. The next morning, she finds another message from her secret admirer together with her other mail. The tone of the letter is more desperate, more wheedling. I saw you throw away my letter yesterday, it says. Why did you do that? Don't you like me? I really thought we would make a great couple. Maybe if you gave me a chance, I could make you so much happier than your ex. The woman doesn't read any farther. She throws the letter to the ground. This is going too far. It was bad enough that a stranger was hitting on her. But now, she knows that her secret admirer is a stalker, too. How else would they know that she threw away their previous letter unless they were watching her as she picked up her mail? And, even more disturbing, how could they possibly know that she had troubles with her ex? She stalks over to the house next door and pounds on the door. When the middle-aged man answers, she confronts him with a letter. 
Did you write this? What's your problem? She demands as she shoves the paper in his face. I don't know what you're trying to do, but I'm not interested. I want you to keep away from me. I don't know what you're talking about, protests the man, holding up his hands in surrender. I, I didn't write anything. The woman doesn't know if she believes him, but she has to admit that the middle-aged man sounds genuinely confused by her accusations. Maybe he's not the culprit. But when she confronts the neighbor living to the other side, she hears a similar story. Are you sending me these letters because they're actually really creepy? I don't like people watching me, says the woman as she confronts her other neighbor. The old woman just shakes her head. Mercy me, I didn't send you a letter. Why would I do that? I could just come over and talk to you. I don't know why you youngsters are always making up stories about weird letters. The young woman wonders about the old woman's final words when she's eating dinner alone in her kitchen later that night. The way that she complained about young people always making up stories about weird letters makes her wonder if this has happened before. Could it be that other young women have lived in this house before her? And were they victims of the same stalker? But who could this stalker be? It's got to be someone close. She can just feel it. At that moment, she looks up from her meal and gasps in surprise. There, right outside her window, is the black mailbox. It's hovering right at the edge of the window, as if it's shyly peeking in, like a bashful caller afraid of being seen. The young woman blinks and rubs her eyes. When she looks again, the mailbox is gone. She rushes to the door and throws it open. The mailbox is right there, standing at the curb at the end of the footpath, just as it's always been. Are her eyes playing tricks on her? Is the stress of her breakup and the mysterious stalker finally getting to her? The next day, she finds another letter. Her stalker is getting even more unhinged, and the messages are becoming downright crazy. The next day, she finds not just one letter in her mailbox, but two. Both messages sound absolutely deranged. Her stalker, and at this point there's no doubt in her mind that a stalker is responsible for these letters, has resorted to threats. Why don't you like me? You better change your attitude if you know what's good for you. You think you're too good for me? What does your ex have that I don't? Maybe you need a real man to really show you the ropes. She crushes the letters in her hands, her face flushing with a combination of fear and rage. Who does this person think that they are? She can't take this pressure much longer. She's ready to report these letters to the police, but she still has no idea who's stalking her. Or does she? She can't help but think about that strange incident the previous night, when she thought that she saw the mailbox standing right outside the window. But that's crazy, isn't it? Her mailbox can't be stalking her, can it? If she tries to tell anyone that her mailbox is sending her threatening messages, everyone is just going to think that she's crazy. But soon, things start to get worse, escalating in ways that force the woman to confront that possibility. That night, she's in her kitchen fixing dinner. She turns from the stove to grab some condiments from the pantry. That's when she sees it. The mailbox. It's not outside this time, it's in the next room. It's standing partially hidden behind the door, again as if it's trying not to be seen. She drops her work and rushes out into the living room, hoping to catch the mailbox in the act. But it's gone. She runs to the window and, once again, sees the mailbox standing at the end of the walkway in the exact same spot that it should be. She's certain that she can't be imagining these things, but, at the same time, what other explanation could there be? She barely gets any sleep that night, tossing and turning with unpleasant dreams. Several times she startles awake, sitting bolt upright in bed, half convinced that the sinister mailbox might even be in the same room with her, watching her as she sleeps. The next day, the exhausted woman rises early from restless dreams and sits on the front porch, waiting for the mail truck to arrive. When the familiar U.S. Postal Service vehicle pulls up to the curb, she stalks over and confronts the mailman. Come on, hand it over, she demands. It's my mail, give it to me. She's too flustered by this whole absurd scenario to bother being polite, and the mailman is in no mood to argue. This woman looks positively insane, he thinks. Her hair is disheveled, her eyes are ringed with heavy black circles, and she looks like she hasn't had a decent night's sleep in weeks. He has to deal with all kinds of crazy customers every day, and he knows better than to push his luck. He shoves the bundle of letters into her arms and jumps back into his truck. The woman quickly shuffles through the stack of letters, scanning the return addresses and throwing each envelope to the ground behind her when she's satisfied that it's not from her stalker. Just as she thought, None of these letters match the description of the blank envelopes that her stalker uses for his messages. She pulls open the mailbox and looks inside. To her horror, there's already a letter inside. She grabs it and feels the blood drain from her face as she looks at the blank envelope. It's another message from her stalker. Now she knows that he's sending the letters through the mail, but 
How did he get this letter into the mailbox without her seeing him? She woke up so early this morning, even before the sun was up, and she's been watching the mailbox for hours. It doesn't make sense that any of her neighbors could have planted this message without her knowing, but the only other possible explanation is that the mailbox itself is somehow writing these letters. She stares at the black aluminum box, the dark, dented metal suddenly taking on a sinister aspect in the early morning sunlight. Maybe she really is going insane. Maybe she just misses her ex-girlfriend so much that she's imagining all this madness and just projecting her fear of being alone onto this mailbox. No, no, she doesn't believe that at all. She's going to put a stop to this, once and for all. The woman jogs into her garage and returns several moments later with a shovel. She doesn't know whether she's hallucinating or not, but she's had just about enough of this stupid mailbox. She wants it out of her life. Even if it's not stalking her, even if this is all in her mind, it's clear that there's something off about this mailbox, something that's putting her ill at ease. She starts to shovel dirt away from the base of the mailbox post, grunting and sweating with the exertion of her work, but not stopping until the post is loose. She grabs at the thick wooden post and hoists the mailbox, post and all, out of its pit. She drags it across the lawn to her driveway, where, with considerable effort, she manages to shove it into the back seat of her car, ripping the upholstery of the seats and spilling wet dirt all over the floor. She doesn't care about the damage to her car. She just needs to get rid of this mailbox. A chill runs down her spine at the thought of taking a long car ride with that thing behind her. She doesn't trust it at all, and the idea of turning her back on it. Well, she doesn't know what kind of danger she'll be in. As she climbs into the driver's seat, she adjusts the rearview mirror so that she can keep an eye on the mailbox for the whole trip. To her immense relief, it doesn't move once on the whole car ride, even though her nervous eyes keep flicking to the rearview mirror to assuage her fears. She finally arrives at her destination, the city dump. She pulls up to the front gate and honks her horn until the custodian comes out of the guardhouse. She motions for him to remove the mailbox from her back seat, and the panicked expression on her face tells him that he should be quick about it. He's barely pulled the mailbox clear the door when the woman peels away, skidding along the curb and gunning the engine to drive away from the dump and the abandoned mailbox as fast as possible. After a few minutes on the road, she starts to calm down. She breathes a deep sigh of relief, a new sense of calm finally settling over her now that she's removed that awful mailbox from her life. She adjusts the rearview mirror to look at her reflection, wincing at the sight of her haggard eyes and blotchy skin. The stress of the last few days must have been really getting to her, but now she feels like she can finally move on with her life. She manages a tense chuckle at the memory. The whole idea that her mailbox was stalking her seems increasingly absurd the further she drives from the dump, but she can't help but feel much better. But when she turns the corner to arrive at her home street, she sees something that she cannot believe. Her eyes bulge from her head, and her fingers tighten around the steering wheel, her knuckles going white. It can't be. The mailbox is back. The same black aluminum box and wooden post. Of course, after all she's been through, she would recognize it anywhere. It's still there, in her front yard, at the end of the walkway. But she's certain that she just dropped it off the dump, right? There's no way that she could have imagined digging up the mailbox and lugging it all the way to the junkyard. Could it be possible that the mailbox somehow followed her home? Could it be that desperate for her attention and companionship? The woman doesn't say a word. She keeps driving, passing her new home without stopping. She can't deal with this anymore. She glances at the rearview mirror, one last look at the cozy little house where she thought that she could start a new life. But she can't live like this. She keeps driving, and she doesn't look back. On the corner, the mailbox stands still and silent, as if it had never moved and never will. Dealing with a stalker can be a frightening and dangerous situation, but it can be even worse when your stalker isn't even human. That woman never had to see the mailbox again after she left the property, but the SCP Foundation is very familiar with this dangerously obsessive romantic, which it calls SCP-1269. SCP-1269 looks like a perfectly ordinary mailbox situated in front of a perfectly ordinary house somewhere in Massachusetts. It is made of black aluminum, possessing a red flag and a white plastic post. It stands at a third of a meter tall, and the house number of the corresponding property is printed on its side. It is unknown how long SCP-1269 has resided at the property, although dents and bruises on the mailbox chassis indicate that it's probably been there for some time. SCP-1269 remains a perfectly ordinary mailbox when its corresponding house is unoccupied or else occupied by a male resident. 
but when a woman aged 23 years old or older takes up residence on the property, SCP-1269 will start to manifest its anomalous properties. About two weeks after the woman moves into the house, SCP-1269 will start to manifest unaddressed romantic letters targeted towards the resident of the house. Surveillance within SCP-1269 has shown that the letters manifest approximately three seconds after mail delivery. SCP-1269's anomalous properties will manifest only when a single female, 23 years or older, hereafter referred to as the occupant, resides within the same property as SCP-1269. Approximately two weeks after the occupant moves in, SCP-1269 will start to manifest unaddressed letters every four days. The contents of the letter are romantic in nature and are targeted towards the occupant of the house. Surveillance within SCP-1269 has shown the letters manifest approximately three seconds after the occupant's mail has been delivered. At first, letters will manifest once every four days, but SCP-1269 will quickly escalate its obsessive behavior to the point that multiple letters will appear daily. The letters will become more obsessive and less coherent as SCP-1269's stalking behavior intensifies. When not under direct supervision of the house occupant, SCP-1269 will teleport to a location near the occupant and face them as if it's trying to watch them. It will always manifest in an area where it is partially obstructed, such as peeking through a window or behind some shower curtains. Sometimes, when the resident is asleep, SCP-1269 will teleport near the occupant without obstruction. SCP-1269 will not follow the occupant off the property, and all anomalous properties will cease manifesting if the occupant moves out of the house. Attempts to remove SCP-1269 from its location have so far been unsuccessful. SCP-1269 will teleport to its original curbside location after one hour of relocation. If attempts are made to replace SCP-1269 with a new mailbox, the mailbox will be teleported away with SCP-1269 appearing in its place. Approximately three hours after the disappearance of the new mailbox, it will reappear in a dumpster several kilometers away. Mailboxes recovered so far have all been found in varying amounts of disrepair within garbage bags and covered in obscene graffiti, as if SCP-1269 has become violently jealous of any other mailbox it sees as trying to replace it. SCP-1269 has also shown similar violent jealousy toward humans that it might believe are vying for the affection of any woman living in its house. In a recent experiment, a D-class male was moved onto the property with the then-current test occupant, a D-class female after seven weeks of residence. Interestingly, SCP-1269 ceased its teleporting activity in response to this male presence, but three days later, the D-class male disappeared from the property, causing SCP-1269 to resume all anomalous behavior. Two weeks later, the body of the missing D-class male was discovered in the same dumpster where SCP-1269 had previously disposed of rival mailboxes. The property where SCP-1269 is located is to remain under the custody of the Foundation, with one male researcher residing in the house to monitor the behavior of SCP-1269. Because of the dangerous lengths to which it will go to attain the current object of its affection, SCP-1269 has been designated with Object Class Euclid. It's our job to make sure it doesn't menace anyone else. As night falls, Everything sinks into a soft blue darkness under a blanket of twinkling stars. In a nice, cozy home, in a normal, quiet suburb, a sweet little boy is being read a bedtime story by his mother. It's a classic, Little Red Riding Hood, the story of a little girl traveling through the woods to her grandmother's house, only to be set upon by the big bad wolf. A tale as old as time, with an important message for people of all ages. We should fear what lurks in the dark since what is there is often waiting and watching with hungry eyes. As the boy lays in bed, clutching the top of his blanket, his mother continues telling him the tale. She describes the tiny girl in the red hood, holding a little wicker basket, stumbling through the dark. The wolf, with its big, hungry eyes, weaves through the darkness of the trees, following her every move. The little boy can barely contain his fear when Little Red Riding Hood opens the door to her grandmother's old cottage and creeps inside, where she realizes that something is very wrong. Her grandmother looks different. Those great big eyes, that twitching wet black nose, those huge terrible teeth dripping with saliva. All the better to eat you with, my dear. 
His mother senses that her son isn't taking this well and notices that he's shuddering underneath the blankets. She closes the book, smiles, and insists that the story has a happy ending. This does nothing to ease the growing specter of fear stretching out over the boy. Could the big bad wolf be waiting outside his window, watching him with those red, ravenous eyes? Would the window really keep such a monster at bay? He doesn't feel so sure. The little boy's mother kisses him on the forehead and tells him that if he needs anything, she and his father are just down the hall. He's been having nightmares lately, but that's all they are. Nightmares, all in his head. Nothing in there could actually hurt him. He's alone now, shivering in bed, trying to focus on the light of his tiny nightlight plugged into his wall, a little glowing friend that will watch over him and keep him safe. His mom and dad got it for him when he told them he was afraid of the dark. But there's still a lot more dark in this room than light. His closet door suddenly creaks open, and he bites his tongue to stifle a scream. It's an old door. It opens by itself sometimes. There's nothing to worry about, nothing to worry about at all. It's a mantra his parents had drilled into him on prior instances when this door had creaked open. Even in the dark, the little boy can make out something. It looks like one of the many other shadows created by his nightlight, but it's different. Something darker than the dark. And it's moving, sliding out of his closet. A fog shaped like some unknowable creature. There's nothing to worry about, nothing to worry about at all, he tells himself over and over again. The fog leaves the closet entirely, and it starts getting closer to the boy's bed. As it rises up from the floor, the boy can see something in the fog. He can see eyes. Big, glowing, hungry eyes. Like the eyes of a big bad wolf, ready to eat him alive. He opens his mouth to scream, but only a yawn comes out. He wants to get up and run to his parents' room down the hall, but his body feels so heavy, his movements so slow and sluggish. He can't move, and the eyes of the monster made of dark keep getting closer. There's nothing to worry about, nothing to... Mom, Dad, please help me. All he can do is think about screaming, not actually make any noise, as his eyes shut, and he drifts off into the land of dreams. He opens his eyes to find that he's standing in a dark and endless forest. The trees are tall, extending up into a black and starless sky but there's something wrong with them. Bodies, hundreds of them, old and desiccated, are speared onto their branches, their faces locked into what looks like permanent, silent screams. A thick, viscous black liquid drips from some of the bodies, pooling into what looks like puddles of tar around his feet. When he looks down, he sees that he's wearing strange, old-fashioned clothes. His shirt is bright red. There's a low, bassy growling behind him, like thunder, like a rumbling earthquake primal and deadly. He can feel it vibrating in his bones. Moving slowly, as though he was underwater, he turns and sees the beast looming behind him. A giant, wolf-like monster made from shadows, teeth cut from jagged black glass, eyes glowing and hungry. He's never been so terrified in his life as he is right now, standing in front of this monster that seemed to be the literal embodiment of fear. The embodiment of deep, animal terror. The beast that haunts the dreams of every frightened boy and girl. It growls again, and he begins to run. But it's not real running. It's dream running, as if the gravity were too strong, slow and cumbersome through the thick, confining air. He keeps pushing through the resistance all around him, but the wolf made of shadows moves quickly. It weaves through the trees, its mouth dripping wet with hunger, its eyes emitting a dim glow like the nightlight back in his bedroom. He runs for what feels like hours, tears streaking down his cheeks, until finally he can see salvation in the distance, a house standing in the middle of a clearing in the woods. But not just any house, it's his house. In the logic of the dream, he knew that his mom and dad would be inside. They'd help him. They'd keep him safe from the monster. He just needs to get there. He just needs to survive. He finally reaches the front door and tries to open it, but it's locked. So he hammers his fists against the wood, screaming and crying for his parents. He looks over his shoulder and sees the shadow wolf charging towards him through the darkness of the woods, its huge dark feet hitting the ground with the speed and force of gunshots, getting closer and closer and closer. With one final desperate pound of his fist, the door to his home finally swings open and he falls through. The door closes behind him as he hits the floor, and the sound of the wolf is gone. He gets up and looks out of a nearby window, 
to see that there's no forest outside, just his neighborhood again, underneath a starless sky. He looks down and sees he's not wearing those strange, old-fashioned clothes anymore, just the same pajamas he'd worn to bed. Are things back to normal now? Had it all been a dream? He tries a nearby light switch, but nothing happens, still dark. That dread comes creeping back in. If it had been a dream, what did that make this? He starts making his way up the stairs, calling out to his mom and dad. There's no response. He climbs further, walking down the hallway towards their bedroom door. The hallway seems so much longer than he remembered it, but for some reason, he never stops to question the discrepancy. He just wants his mother and father. Not long after, the little boy reaches the door to his parents' bedroom and opens it. The room is so dark, but he can make out their forms lying in the bed. He approaches, calling for them again, but there's no response. Instead, he just hears an awful wheezing sound, like air being let out of a balloon. When his eyes adjust to the dark, he sees that something is terribly wrong with both of his parents. They're now old and thin, with sickly yellowing skin hanging from their bones. Their eyes, milky with cataracts, are set deep in their jaundiced faces. The mere sight of them forces a gasp out of him. Their heads slowly turn with audible crunches. Their chests rise and fall in those same slow, mechanical exhalations. They both look like life hurts for them now. The little boy begins to cry. They beckon him closer, wanting to comfort him. But he's too terrified of their appearance to take a single step towards them. His mother opens her thin-lipped mouth, revealing rotten teeth, and says, Sweetheart, I'm so sorry, but Mommy and Daddy can't take care of you anymore. We can't even be here for much longer. We need to go. I'm sorry that we don't have more time. The little boy can see his parents aging by the second, getting thinner and frailer and sicker right in front of him. His pity and fear outweighs his revulsion, and he steps forward to embrace them. They're so terribly cold. He grips his mother's hand, but he can feel the bones turning to dust inside her paper-thin skin. It's going to be okay, darling, she whispers, her voice hoarse and brittle in her final moments. Your grandmother will take care of you from now on. That's when he hears it behind him again. That terrible, low rumble, the primal growl. As his parents both turn to dust in their bed, he turns and sees the monster, the same wolf made of shadows, filling up the doorway. It seems even bigger in here, bulging through the doorway, thick black saliva dripping from its obsidian fangs. He tries to repeat that same mantra to himself. There's nothing to worry about, nothing to worry about at all. But suddenly he's short of breath, as an immense shadowy claw closes around his torso. It lifts him up off the ground until he can feel the beast's breath on his face. But it isn't hot like it should be. It's freezing, like a gust of wind in the deep snow. With a deep, commanding voice, the monster says, Only lucky children get to wake up from a dream like this. And not everyone can be lucky. All he can do is scream when the wolf's jaws close around his head, but not a soul can hear him. He's swallowed up into the darkness of the monster, and soon, he's nothing at all. In the waking world, the sun rises, morning birds caw and tweet, alarms go off. But when the little boy's mother checks his bed that morning, it's empty. He's vanished without a trace. In the panic of the days, weeks, and months that follow, in the extensive search that turns up nothing, and that unlucky little boy was never seen again, it never even occurs to his parents to ask, did we leave that closet door open? Did you suffer from bad dreams as a child? Night terrors? There's no shame in it. It's not an uncommon affliction after all. Perhaps there's a hazy, half-formed memory in your mind of waking up screaming when your parents turned on the lights, comforting you, telling you that it was just a bad dream and nothing more. But what if it wasn't? What if it was SCP-080? This vaporous entity, nicknamed the Dark Form by some who have worked with it, is every child's worst nightmare. And if you give it a chance, every adult's worst nightmare too. That's because this black, smoke-like figure has the anomalous ability to induce extreme drowsiness in anyone who spends more than half an hour near it in the dark. Shortly after falling asleep, if nobody comes in and rescues the victim by turning on the lights, they will experience the most horrible nightmares you can possibly imagine. 
So horrible, in fact, that those who have suffered these nightmares and survive often experience irreparable, lifelong psychological trauma. And in the grand scheme of things, those are still the lucky ones. If you're unlucky, like the little boy who vanished from his bed, you'll disappear forever, consumed by SCP-080. The creature itself is difficult to properly see due to its lack of consistent form and due to the fact that it only appears in the darkness, but those who have witnessed it can only seem to remember one key detail – glowing eyes in the smoke. Because of its preference for dark places, SCP-080 often takes refuge in closets and under the bed, where it can vanish out of sight. Bright light automatically causes the creature to disappear and manifest elsewhere, and therefore, should you start feeling unusually drowsy in the dark, turning on the lights is the best thing to do. But these must be bright lights. The soft glow of a standard children's night light is not powerful enough to ward off the creature. The SCP Foundation conducted a series of experiments, hoping to see whether SCP-080 had any kind of real physical body, and if it was possible for human beings to safely interact with it. In the first of these experiments, a 19-year-old male D-Class was sent into the chamber to interact with SCP-080. Unsurprisingly, he immediately became extremely distressed upon seeing the figure with glowing eyes forming in the dark. He described it as being human-shaped, but far too big to be a human. He begged to be released from the chamber, but by this point, he'd already started yawning and the drowsiness was setting in. The researchers running the experiment wanted to see what would happen next, though, and eventually, his pleas to be released fell silent as he drifted off to sleep. When guards were finally sent in to check on him, they found… nothing at all. Nothing remained of the D-Class. He'd been consumed by SCP-080, just like so many others. Next, a 30-year-old female D-Class was sent into SCP-080's chamber. When she was able to make out the vaporous form with the glowing eyes, she was instructed to try and physically touch it. She followed the orders. However, upon touching the entity directly, she immediately fell unconscious. She was quickly retrieved from the room, since the Foundation wanted to make sure they could interview her rather than letting SCP-080 consume her. According to a physical exam given to her by the Foundation medics, she'd experienced no physical effects. Her mind, on the other hand, was a very different story. She'd vacillate wildly between a state of borderline catatonia and extreme paranoid distress. In a debriefing meeting with a Foundation researcher, she had difficulty recounting what exactly had happened during her test with SCP-080. When she did begin to recollect, she started screaming in terror and yelling about how they would try to take her back to the monster. Then, without warning, she leaped across the table and began to attack the researcher, forcing the attending guards to intervene, and unfortunately, they were forced to terminate her. It seemed as though this was always the intended effect of her outburst. She preferred death from a Foundation guard over experiencing SCP-080 again. The testing continued, though, and a third subject was sent into the room, a 24-year-old D-Class male dosed on a powerful amphetamine to hopefully ward off the drowsiness-inducing effects of SCP-080. This did not appear to work, though, and over time, the same sleepiness started to set in. The amphetamine, however, still caused elevated levels of aggression, and the D-Class began to express violent intent towards SCP-080. He approached the vaporous mass and attempted to strike it, but when his fist touched the entity, he immediately collapsed. When his body was retrieved, it was found that he died of a sudden massive heart attack. During the autopsy, as Foundation staff examined his body, they reported feeling a profound sense of discomfort and unease, as though they were being watched. The retrieval team also reported feeling acutely aware of SCP-080 watching them as they exited the chamber with the final D-Class's body. The mere presence of SCP-080 then started causing problems for some staff members at the containment site. The researchers assigned to SCP-080 reported strange and unsettling dreams and that they were occurring at an unusually frequent level, disrupting their sleep patterns and, by extension, their work performance. This led to them discovering the possibility that SCP-080 may have some kind of hazardous mimetic effect that can linger among its victims even when they aren't in its direct proximity. After the lead researcher on the team walked into traffic and sadly passed away, it was made mandatory for all staff members working in SCP-080's sector to keep comprehensive dream journals so that the emergence of patterns of violent or unsettling dreams could be detected before things got too out of hand, just like they had with the lead researcher. However, the lead researcher would not be the last to lose his life to SCP-080. 
Two researchers stood just beyond the blackout curtains, observing SCP-080 for 40 minutes, believing that the divider would keep them safe from SCP-080's negative anomalous effects. They were terribly wrong. Both apparently fell asleep in the observation area, and when another researcher later entered the room, they discovered that their bodies were gone. However, strangely enough, everyone working in that sector of the site found that they did have a better night's sleep after the incident. Staff were reminded to exercise maximum caution whenever interfacing with SCP-080. Their direct exposure should never exceed 30 minutes under any circumstances, even the section of staff members that, for some reason, are completely unable to see SCP-080 and appear to somehow be immune to its effects. Considering the fact that everyone around the site started feeling better after the strange incident concerning the two missing researchers, researchers have sought O5 Council permission to feed a D-Class to the monster once a month in order to negate the damaging effects it has on site staff mental health. Despite the protests of the Ethics Committee, a member of the Council approved the measure. SCP-080 is contained in a 4 meter by 4 meter room with a smaller antechamber located on the south wall for easy research access. There's also an observation room on the north wall, separated with blackout curtains to prevent light from getting in and dispersing SCP-080. Containment procedures dictate that SCP-080 should never, under any circumstances, be removed from the chamber. Any light-producing devices are also forbidden. While the Foundation currently has this monster under lock and key, all it would take is a stray ray of light to free it once more, which has warranted it being given the Euclid containment class. All members of staff are also kindly remembered to stop referring to this creature as the Boogeyman. After all, there's a lot of power in giving a fear-manipulating creature a name like that, and the last thing we want is SCP-080 having more power than it already has. Papers fly up in the air in every direction as the office workers run for their lives. The PA, brand new at her job, can't figure out where on earth the emergency exit is. She tries every door, but they are either locked or go nowhere. The vast office maze, uncanny in its complexity, stretches along endless hallways and old directories. At the end of the corridor, right in front of her, is a door with a touch bar on it. That will surely be a fire escape, a way for her to get away from the monster. She throws her whole body weight against the bar and tumbles through the door, landing in a janitor's closet. No way out except back. Lying there, sprawled amongst the mops and cleaning products, the PA rolls over and stares back down the corridor. Somehow, she still holds the Starbucks iced latte in her hand. A forked tongue appears around the corner, followed by a flattened nose, long razor-like teeth, and a pair of blank reptile eyes. The hulking anaconda winds its way along the carpets, licking the air, tasting the scent of the PA's perfume. She is powerless, lying there crouched in the cramped janitor's closet as the enormous snake slithers towards her. It rears up tall as a human and bears its fangs. The PA closes her eyes and readies herself for the inevitable bite. The knife and fork land on the table with a loud enough clatter to make all the other patrons turn. A large man with a bushy beard spills tomato soup down his chest while a snooty food reviewer chokes on the seafood she's just been trying to swallow. A woman, shaking with rage, screams into her phone. Next time you'll get my order right. It's a caramel oat milk latte with eight ice cubes. No, no, I don't care that one of them melted. It's not good enough. In her venomous tirade, she threatens the job, life, and even the family of whoever she's talking to. The woman slams her phone down on the table loudly enough to make everyone in the restaurant jump again. This time, one of the waitstaff spills an entire tray of drinks over a table of guests. The commotion is loud enough to make the woman's fury shift in their direction. Excuse me, I'm trying to conduct business here. Could you please not be so rude? Stalking into the head office of Louis Vuitton, the woman walks so fast that the brand new assistant following her struggles to catch up. The PA is still signing her contract of employment as they go, doing her best to multitask as she lists off her boss's itinerary. Design meeting from 1 to 1.30, yoga with a personal trainer from 1.30 to 1.45, then into an urgent meeting to get ahead of the latest animal cruelty scandal. The woman struggles to keep track of which issue her colleagues are complaining about this time. It could be the animal testing from the perfume line, the snakeskin rug they've just had to discontinue, or the polar bear scarf they've just announced for the winter collection. She can sense the headache coming on already. The new PA hands her an iced coffee as they get into the elevator. 
she takes a sip and decides she doesn't even want it, throwing it in the trash as soon as they reach her floor. She's just about to launch into a rant about animal activists and their oversensitivity when the smell hits her. Opening the door to her office, she's punched in the face by the stench of rotting fish. Lying on the floor of her office is a 600-pound tuna fish staring blankly at the ceiling. The woman is so shocked that, for once, she stops yelling and just stares in surprise. In her 35 years in New York, never once has anyone so much as said the word no to her, let alone pulled a stunt like this. She turns around to face her personal assistant and asks for her name. It's Melanie. The poor girl is terrified. She asks Melanie why there's a fish in her office, and before the girl can even muster up a reply, the heartless corporate overlord fires her on the spot. She hadn't even signed her contract yet. Once Melanie the PA leaves the room, the woman finds herself alone with the giant tuna, her anger simmering. Looking down at the dead animal, she sees a crumpled mess of cream-colored silicone under it, along with a few wet articles of clothing. Using the tip of her cigarette holder, she pulls at the crumpled silicone to try and extract it from under the fish. Huh? Strange. It looks almost like one of those human masks you buy at a Halloween store, except it's a full suit. In fact, it looks remarkably similar to her head of innovation and product design. Lying on the floor next to it is something small and innocent looking. It's part of a zipper, broken by the looks of it. The black metal is slightly bent out of shape and worn away at the edges. It looks cheap and used, not the kind of material one would expect to see anywhere within a five-mile radius of this office. She picks up the zipper and rolls it between her fingers. Her headache is back. She needs a coffee. Pressing the intercom button, she demands that her new PA immediately go out and get one, forgetting that she'd just fired her a few moments earlier. Walking over to the window of her top-floor office, she looks down at the crowds of animal rights protesters' stories and stories below, rolling the zipper between her fingers the whole time. Her thumb is itching slightly. Looking down at the metal tab in frustration, the woman sees that the zipper has somehow embedded itself into her skin. Puzzled, she leans in close for a better look, going a little cross-eyed. She couldn't have been squeezing it that hard, could she? Tentatively, the woman tries to pull the zipper out, but it just tugs at her skin, not budging at all. A faint sense of panic starts to well up in her chest. She pulls at it again, trying her best to dislodge it from her flesh, but it won't move. Then a second idea pops into her brain. What if she just… The woman slides the zipper down along the length of her thumb. It glides smoothly, feeling just like the one you'd use to open your raincoat. Except, as it travels along her thumb, the skin itself seems to separate and flop apart, leaving a dark, empty space inside. The layers of her skin peel back as if they're made of rubber, and a flow of steam hisses out from the gap in her thumb. The zipper reaches the palm of her hand, and her thumb dangles there limply, empty, as if nothing had ever been inside of it. Her eyes widen with amazement. She continues to slide the zipper across her palm, up her wrist, and towards her elbow. As it goes, that gentle waft of steam continues to escape from the gap, exposing a row of metal teeth. She can't stop. The zipper glides up her bicep and towards her shoulder. In one final move, she slides it directly across her collarbone and falls to the ground, lifeless. The pile of empty skin sits crumpled on the floor of her office. For several seconds, nothing moves. Then, the middle of the skin shifts slightly, almost as if something inside it had moved. The same happens again and again, just as the woman's newest PA arrives with a nice coffee held proudly in her hands. Why is it so dark in here? What's happened to the lights? She must have had an episode. She doesn't remember falling over, but here she is on the ground in total darkness. The only thing she could recall was hallucinating that zipper. The woman shuffles this way and that, trying to get her bearings. She attempts to put an arm out to lift herself up, but can't. She tries her other arm. Again, nothing. No movement at all. Come to think of it, she can't even feel her arm. Maybe a leg? No luck there either. She must have hit her head pretty hard on the ground when she landed. Perhaps she's got a concussion. The woman does her best to sit up straight and finds that it's actually quite easy. Her back arches and curves effortlessly, twisting at whatever angle she wants. All of that yoga must have been paying off. All of a sudden, she's dimly aware of a light in front of her. What's the old cliché they always say in movies? Don't go towards it? 
screw that. The light in front of her is the only thing she can see right now. Without thinking about it, the woman stretches her neck forward and finds that it moves easily and surprisingly far. She must be concussed. It feels like she's almost gliding in any direction she wants. She simply moves her head and she finds her whole body drifting in that direction effortlessly. That spot of light she was looking at? It's not some mystical end of the tunnel situation. It's a gap in whatever material has been covering her. The woman pokes her head out and takes in a breath of fresh air, doing her best to shrug off the rest of the bundle of whatever it was that she'd been buried inside. Was it silicone? She turns her head to look back at it and jumps at the sight. She'd been inside of one of those silicone costumes, the same as the other one under the tuna that had been in her office, except this one. She had seen that face millions of times on magazine covers, plastered across billboards in her selfie camera and in the mirror at home. She is looking at the crumpled husk of herself. A scream fills her head, and she darts her gaze around suddenly to see a PA standing in the doorway with a nice latte trembling in her hand. Yes, some good news. The woman opens her mouth to talk to the PA, but the words don't come. She tries her best to squeeze her lungs and articulate her vocal cords, but the best she can manage is a soft hissing sound. That's when she spies her reflection in the mirror on the wall and sees the dead reptilian eyes and enormous curved fangs of an anaconda looking back at her. Pandemonium fills the office of Louis Vuitton as the anaconda weaves its way around the corridors, passing the reception desk and through the break room, approaching anyone it finds and asking for help. The snake tries its best to look very calm and innocent, assuring people that it poses no threat to them. However, that's a very difficult thing to do when every time it opens its mouth, all anybody can see is a set of enormous teeth pointing straight at them. Within a couple of minutes, everybody seems to have evacuated, leaving the snake on her own, winding her way through the corridors, trying her best not to panic. That's when she spies her PA lying helpless in the janitor's closet. Relief washes over her as she sees that the girl has nowhere to run. This should be easy to talk to her then. The snake rushes over and stands tall, looking down at the girl. She opens her mouth, leans in close, and takes the ice latte from the girl's hand. Placing the cup gently on the carpet, the snake slurps a bit of the coffee through the straw. It's absolutely vile, clashing horribly with the hypersensitive taste receptors on her tongue. She tries to spit it out, but discovers that snakes have very different mouth anatomy than hers, and that motion isn't so easy. Besides, she realizes if she's going to have any hope of convincing this girl of who she really is, taking a drink from that Starbucks cup is probably her best chance to do it. Coiling herself up to look as small as possible, the snake sips away at the coffee and looks at the PA in what she hopes is a reassuring way. Very slowly, she can see the cog starting to turn in the girl's face as she realizes what's happened. Reaching into her handbag, the PA, in shaking hands, pulls out a notebook and a pen and offers them to the snake. It's slow progress and takes a lot of work, but eventually, the snake is able to get enough control over the motor functions of its tail to grip the pen and scribble out a few words, just before the pest control team arrives and tranquilizes her. For three weeks, the anaconda is locked up in the animal control center in New York City. The center wasn't equipped for dealing with giant snakes, so they ended up putting her in the largest dog holding pen they had, which only just about fits her if she coils up in the right way. Three times a day, one of the keepers will toss her slabs of raw meat. She'd always been a fan of a rare steak. Little did she know just how enjoyable a raw one could be. Aside from mealtimes, she's miserable. Doing everything she can to communicate to the workers there that she's really a sentient woman, not only a sentient woman, but also the head of one of the world's largest high fashion brands, she quickly discovers she's talking to a brick wall, or rather, hissing up one. The more she thinks about it, the more her situation reminds her of some of the photos that had been passed across her desk over the prior few months at various planning meetings. Photos from undercover journalists who had visited her company's factory in the Far East and discovered cages upon cages of live animals locked up, either to be killed for their skin or to be hosed down with chemicals to see if they develop a rash. It was lying there on the floor that she discovered that snakes don't have tear ducts. She would have liked it if they did. Maybe that way, she'd be able to get some of her emotions out. The foundation moved quickly as soon as the news story broke. Agents were in and out of the office within hours. The zipper was placed into a sealed bag and transported directly to Site 64, where it has since remained in a standard-issue locker. 
A series of testing sessions were established to ascertain exactly how SCP-3660 functioned. As soon as the zipper is pressed against the skin of a human being, it embeds itself. Test subjects report no feelings of pain and discomfort, just confusion. That's how the zipper has been able to press itself in so deep. Only a handful of subjects have reported feeling a slight itching sensation and the desire to pull out the tab to relieve that feeling. It sits just below the layer of the skin, in the same way that it would on a jacket or hoodie. If left untouched within 10 minutes, SCP-3660 will activate on its own accord, sliding steadily along the subject's skin and unzipping them. As this happens, the subject is instantaneously, and again without pain, transfigured into an animal. This process occurs internally beneath the layer of skin as it unzips. According to the basic laws of physics, a transformation this drastic and quick would require enormous amounts of energy, and so researchers expected to find heat and pressure levels high enough to instantly boil the blood of the subject. However, the only abnormal thermal readings came from a slight hiss of steam escaping the gap in the skin as it unzips. The new opening of the skin is now lined with a row of metal teeth on either side, as the skin itself appears to be transformed into a slightly different texture and material. Researchers note that the empty skin of the test subject looks and feels somewhat uncanny. Test samples taken into the lab reveal that the complex carbon-based multicellular organ has somehow been transmuted into consistent silicone rubber. Several tests involved placing the D-Class personnel atop a weighing scale, and researchers were shocked to see enormous and rapid fluctuations in weight depending on the animal that the subject was transformed into. Transformed is the correct word to use here. The animal that emerges from the opening in the skin is not an entirely new life form. It is difficult to build a method of communication with every creature that emerges from the testing process. Since the animal created seems to be largely random, they can often pose real challenges in terms of setting up a method for feedback on how the test went. For example, three subjects have been transmuted into various species of squid, which had to be quickly rushed to an aquatic test chamber before drying out. Once inside these test chambers, while the squids were evidently very intelligent, they lacked the motor skills and limbs to be able to form any kind of sign language or even point out letters on a board. Great apes, however, have proven much easier to work with, as they can quickly adopt sign language and even attempt rudimentary vowel sounds with their throats. What is clear from this testing is that the animal that emerges retains the memories of the person it has replaced. It has the same attachment to loved ones, the same fears, and the same idiosyncrasies. Or at least it does when these things do not come into conflict with the animal's biological nature. One test subject, for example, had always had a strong affection for hamsters. However, when that test subject emerged from the pile of silicone skin as a sparrow hawk, it had a markedly different relationship with them, something that it expressed guilt over for the duration of testing. Try as it might, however, the hawk could not fight its urge to feed on the hamsters whenever it was offered the opportunity. Similar tendencies can be noticed in animals' mating behaviors. A survey of the test subjects revealed that 94.7% of male species reported resisting the urges of feeding and breeding to be the aspect most difficult to control in their new form. From all of the testing conducted thus far, only amniotes, cephalopods, and chondrichthians have been observed emerging from the test subjects' empty skin sacs. Testing is ongoing to determine if there is a set pattern to the animals emerging, although thus far, no pattern has been observed. One particularly memorable test saw a blue whale emerge from the body of one of the D-Class personnel, causing significant damage to the testing facilities as the room had not been constructed with that large of a creature in mind. Since then, testing has been temporarily suspended, as the Foundation discovered that one of the senior researchers was under-reporting the level of testing being conducted and quickly turning Site-64 into the SCP Petting Zoo for highly gifted animals. Fortunately, the head of Louis Vuitton and her PA managed to get in contact with the SCP Foundation. Or rather, the SCP Foundation got in contact with her after she was seen creating a huge social media conspiracy about the fact that her former boss had been transformed into a snake. The anaconda was soon located and transferred to Site-64. Several interview sessions with the snake found an animal humbled by her time in a cage. After a couple of hours of negotiating with the senior researchers, she was able to agree on a deal where she would be used as part of a promotional campaign for charities against the mistreatment of animals. She would attend filming days and perform on camera to show the abuse that animals went through in testing facilities. The general public believes that the footage is computer-generated, and a VFX house has been credited in the adverts. 
Meanwhile, the Amazon rainforest has one new occupant, a colossal snake that is kind to humans and has a strange addiction to iced coffee. A hand clasps around your throat, cutting off your scream. You try to move, but the hands of the two people restraining you won't allow it. You're being dragged towards something monstrous and terrible in the corner, something hiding under a white sheet. You will die a painful death, and the ones dragging you towards it are your parents. As the dewy green of summer begins to fade, the grass drying, the air chilling, and the leaves turning shades of fire and gold, most children's thoughts turn to Halloween. Visions of fun-sized candy bars spilling out of plastic pumpkin buckets, of ill-fitting rubber masks that smell like the back of a party store, of candy apples and ringing doorbells, and terrifying their friends with scary stories. It's a magical time where anyone can be anything, and candy is free to anyone who asks the question, trick or treat. But as those children get older, Halloween begins to lose its magic. They age out of trick or treating and no longer find themselves amused by carving pumpkins or screaming at plastic skeletons in their neighbors' yards. They age out of the sense of wonder and they find that their neighbors aren't as keen to give away candy to someone with a driver's license. But some children hold on to that love of Halloween into adulthood, transforming the childlike joy into an appreciation for parties, more mature scary stories with blood and guts aplenty, and yes, themed baked goods. You're never too old to enjoy a Rice Krispie treat shaped like a ghost. At least, that's what the sorority girl planning the biggest Halloween party on campus at her small university believes. She has festooned the sorority house with fake cobwebs and ghosts made of hanging bits of gauze, with plastic spiders and zombies made of rubber. There are the classic plastic skeletons, the jack-o'-lanterns filled with battery-powered candles, no fire hazards here, and of course, a huge cauldron filled with punch and dry ice. Smoke billows over the sides of the cauldron as she stirs the garish but inviting lime green liquid inside. She has the lights rigged up to give the place an eerie red glow and has the perfect playlist of Halloween music put together. Now she just needs to wait for the guests to arrive. At first, she worries that no one will come. The first few people to ring the doorbell turn out to be trick-or-treaters, and she sends them away with a fistful of candy bars and a smile. But each time, she is secretly a little disappointed. About an hour after she finished setting up, guests begin to arrive. Even if not everyone at school is into Halloween, there are very few college students who will pass up an opportunity for a party. And before long, the house is filled with dancing pirates, vampires sipping cups of punch, werewolves digging into bowls of chips, and cats flirting with dogs. Everyone is dressed up and embracing the Halloween spirit, and the girl couldn't be happier. She's been so busy playing hostess that she almost forgot to dress up, but she takes a moment to steal away upstairs and put on her costume. A classic witch costume, black dress, black shoes, and complete with a pointy black hat. As she heads back downstairs, dressed up and ready to have a great time, she takes a moment to survey the crowd. It seems like everyone on campus decided to come to her party. The girl is going to get herself a drink and settle in to enjoy her party when she hears the doorbell ring. Someone else is here. But as she walks toward the door, she pauses for a moment, an icy chill of dread washing over her. The party guests know that they can just walk right in. That's what they've been doing all night. And it's almost midnight, much too late for trick-or-treaters. Who's out there? She peers through the peephole and sees someone in a rudimentary ghost costume, covered head to toe in a white sheet. Even if it's someone she knows, she wouldn't be able to recognize them like that. She can't explain why, but she has a bad feeling about this person. She doesn't want to be rude, but she wants to let them in even less. She turns back away from the door, ready to let the stranger stand on her porch all night, and finds all of her party guests standing still, staring at the door staring at her. She tries to laugh it off and get everyone to return to the party, but the energy in the room has shifted. Everyone's focus is on the person on the other side of the door. She walks to the punch bowl, pours herself a cup, and encourages everyone to get back to the party. Instead, a pirate and a mermaid walk to the door, turning the knob even as the girl asks them to stop. They open it, letting the stranger in the sheet inside. The figure glides through the door, moving in a way that seems just a little bit off. The girl is struck with a feeling that she hasn't experienced since she was a little girl, the sense, deep down in her gut, that something could really be a monster. Whatever she does, she can't let the thing in the sheet get close to her. She doesn't know what will happen, 
but the thought of it turns her stomach with a primal sense of danger. She starts to run, but a girl dressed as a tiger grabs hold of her arm, wrenching her back. The girl struggles to free herself, but a man in a vampire costume grabs her other arm, gripping her so tight his knuckles turn white and she can feel the flesh bruising. She pleads with her friends, trying to get them to see reason and release her, but they won't budge. The tiger girl apologizes through tears, but won't let go. As the girl thrashes, pulling so hard to free herself that she worries her arm will break, the figure in the sheet inches closer and closer. She shouts at it, demanding to know who it is, what it wants, why it's hiding behind that sheet. But it doesn't say a word, doesn't give a clue. There's no expression to read, only the blank white fabric. When it reaches the girl, her feet fly out from under her, and she collapses to the ground, yanked forward by an unseen force. Something is pulling her under the sheet. She claws at the floor, trying to drag herself away from the force, but she can't. The party guests watch, helpless, as their hostess disappears under the sheet, until the only thing left is her writhing silhouette and her screams. Then, the screams go quiet. Nothing left of the girl but her witch's hat lying on the floor. The figure gathers its sheet around itself and calmly walks out of the party. Those unfortunate guests watched their even more unfortunate friend encounter the creature known as SCP-6096. SCP-6096 is a humanoid entity that spends all of its time hidden beneath a large cotton sheet. A vague sense of its shape can be garnered by observing the entity, but its body is hidden at all times, preventing a complete physical description from being recorded. However, Foundation researchers have determined via a cursory examination that the entity is 1.55 meters tall and that it weighs approximately 48 kilograms. The sheet itself is larger than SCP-6096's body, trailing on the ground behind it by at least a meter whenever the entity moves. All attempts to remove the sheet in order to get a proper look at the thing have been unsuccessful. One of the most unusual properties of SCP-6096 is that it cannot be harmed. I don't mean that it is impervious to damage, but rather that any living being that attempts to engage in a behavior that would harm the entity finds themselves unable to do so. This includes, but is presumably not limited to, actions such as attempting to attack SCP-6096, attempting to order others to attack SCP-6096, attempting to trick others into attacking SCP-6096 without their knowledge, laying a trap for SCP-6096, ordering others to lay a trap for SCP-6096, creating an autonomous device that would harm SCP-6096, attempting to leave SCP-6096 unsupervised and in harm's way, and attempting to remove SCP-6096's sheet. Most of the time, SCP-6096's behavior is described as peaceful and docile. As long as there is no danger present, it allows itself to be led into containment and remains there with seemingly no objections. However, every so often, the entity becomes active and will attempt to leave its location. It does so at a steady pace with single-minded persistence as it pursues one specific target at a time. It is uncertain how the entity chooses a target, but so far, it has always been a seemingly random human being somewhere on Earth. Not only does SCP-6096 know exactly who its target is, but anyone who observes the entity during an active period finds that they, too, know who it is seeking out. In addition to this anomalous effect, the person will also find themselves compelled to help SCP-6096 reach its intended target. These targets appear to be the only individuals unaffected by SCP-6096's anti-harm properties. A person that the entity has selected will, in fact, be able to harm it. However, none have managed to successfully do so, mainly due to the protective influence of the other humans caught in the creature's anomalous thrall. But what happens when SCP-6096 reaches its target? Research into this has been largely inconclusive, but a few facts are certain. SCP-6096 will pull the person underneath its sheet until they have disappeared from view. If the victim is conscious, they can be heard fighting, struggling, and screaming in unimaginable agony for up to 40 minutes. Then they go silent and are never seen again. Once its chosen victim has disappeared, SCP-6096 becomes docile and largely immobile again and can be led back to containment. Whatever happens to its targets under that sheet, it is definitely not anything good. SCP-6096 was discovered by the SCP Foundation on September 12, 2018, when police were called to the home of the Malian family in the town of Durham, New Mexico. 
Samuel and Amanda Malian greeted the officers in a state of distress, claiming that a person wearing a sheet had come into their home and somehow caused their 16-year-old son Desmond to disappear. Authorities spotted SCP-6096 inside the home and planned to remove the sheet in order to interrogate and detain the suspect, but found themselves unable to take another step closer to the thing. Terrified by their inexplicable encounter, they submitted an incident report to their supervisor, who passed it up through the chain of command in the regional government until it landed in the hands of the SCP Foundation. Alongside the police report, the Foundation was able to access security camera footage from the Malian family home. A transcription of the video's contents is included in the official Foundation files. I'll do my best to summarize its events. The home security footage depicts the Malian family sitting on their living room couch, facing the television. Samuel and Amanda watch a program on TV as Desmond idly scrolls through his phone. Outside, a car can be heard pulling into the driveway. Though the driver's identity has not been confirmed, this is believed to be a local taxi driver named Drake Ellen dropping SCP-6096 off at the Malian's door. A moment later, Samuel draws his wife's attention toward a window. At first, the two are surprised but amused, assuming that SCP-6096 is some sort of errant Halloween decoration. However, they become increasingly disturbed as the sheet-covered figure approaches their door and begins to knock, so softly it is nearly inaudible. As Samuel gets up to answer the door, Amanda grabs her son's arm, holding him in an increasingly tight grip and refusing to let him pull away. Unable to stop herself, no matter how upset she becomes, she holds Desmond still as her husband lets SCP-6096 into the house. It glides across the floor toward Desmond, who struggles to break free from his crying mother's grasp. Amanda can be heard reassuring him, saying, You just stay still, honey. You just close your eyes. It won't hurt. If you just close your eyes, I love you." Desmond struggles harder, but finds himself unable to break his mother's hold. He kicks his legs, knocking his phone to the ground as the sheet-covered entity draws closer and closer. He begs his mother to let him go, but she doesn't budge. His father, through tears, says, "'Just stay still, son. Just stay still. It won't hurt for long. It can't hurt for long. Stay strong. Stay strong for me.'" Starting with his feet, the entity begins to cover Desmond with its sheet, pulling him out of sight. Amanda and Samuel watch in wordless, open-mouthed horror, silent screams stretching their faces into masks of terror and grief. Desmond can be heard screaming, thrashing violently beneath the sheet, though what exactly is happening to him under there cannot be seen. This continues for the next 36 minutes, until Desmond has completely vanished. At this point, SCP-6096 wraps itself in its sheet and sits down on the floor, watching the television without a care in the world. Amanda and Samuel, on the other hand, find themselves able to move on their own again and must reckon with what they just saw, what they just participated in. Samuel collapses to the ground, curling up in the fetal position and rocking back and forth in shock. Amanda stumbles backward, keeping her eyes locked on SCP-6096 and dials 911 on her cell phone. They stay right there until the police arrive. At this point, the video log cuts out. After the SCP Foundation was notified of the incident at the Malian family home, Foundation officers administered Class A amnestics to Amanda and Samuel, as well as to all responding officers who encountered SCP-6096. It is uncertain how long SCP-6096 was operating before this incident, or where it could have come from. SCP-6096's containment is strictly under the jurisdiction of Mobile Task Force Zeta-29, Blood Brothers. The anomaly is kept in a standard humanoid containment chamber, located on the grounds of Site-19, where it is monitored by on-site personnel via video and audio recording devices. If any changes in its behavior are noted, they are to be promptly logged and reported. Unlike most anomalies at the SCP Foundation, SCP-6096 is permitted to leave its containment area whenever it chooses. Whenever it does choose to leave, SCP-6096 must be escorted to its intended destination by MTF Zeta-29. Task Force members may use whatever method of transportation is most convenient at the time. While this group is escorting the entity, a secondary team will travel to its intended target, dosing them with a high-grade tranquilizer to render them unconscious. Once the entity has disposed of its target, it will be accompanied back to its containment chamber. There are no easy jobs at the SCP Foundation aside from the lucky few who get to spend their days playing with SCP-999. But staff assigned to the containment, if you can even call it that, of SCP-6096 
reports some of the lowest morale levels at the organization. A welcome notice from Charlie Simansky, commander of Mobile Task Force Zeta-29, Blood Brothers, is included in the official file, presumably for task force member eyes only. Nevertheless, I feel it is important that I share the contents of this note with all of you, as they provide a valuable look into the perspective of the members of this unfortunate task force. It reads, And there you have it. Welcome to Mobile Task Force Zeta-29. No need to worry about professionalism down here. The higher-ups couldn't demote me if they wanted to. Apparently my presence as the head of SCP-6096 containment is beneficial enough to it that me being reassigned would count as harming it. Lucky me. You're probably wondering how we can be shameless enough to say we have this thing under containment. It comes and goes whenever it feels like it, and if it ever decided it didn't want to come back to its containment cell, we have literally no way of forcing it. And yeah, you're probably also thinking that calling that room a containment chamber instead of a hotel room is just as shameful. To that I say, you're absolutely right. There's nothing we can do against SCP-6096. Feel free to self-medicate until you're able to accept that. Don't hold back. You're going to become very familiar with that feeling of gnawing guilt. I know I did, the first time I had to hold the door to a maternity ward open for this thing. The idea of containing SCP-6096 is a bad joke. We all decided a long time ago that the only way out of this nightmare is liquidation, decommissioning, neutralization, whatever you want to call it. But that's no walk in the park either. I've stood in that chamber for hours, gun pointed at 6096's head, screaming at my finger just to tighten slightly. Didn't work. You can't harm SCP-6096, no matter how much you want to. You can't even try to start a Rube Goldberg kind of thing to eventually harm SCP-6096. It's just a fact of the world, maybe a semi-hazard or whatever it's called. The way I see it then, there are three main ways out of this nightmare. One, another organization, maybe the GOC, takes a shot at it without realizing what they're dealing with. Maybe they think we're transporting something much more dangerous. Maybe they think we're in over our heads with it, and they take it out with a drone or something, blow the thing to hell while we're transporting it. A bomb would kill it easy, I think. It feels weak. This would only work so long as the GOC thinks they're bombing something else entirely. If they knew it was SCP-6096, they'd just be contained too. 2. An AIC deals with it. I don't know if an artificial intelligence is immune to SCP-6096's effects, but the fact that it won't let me tell one of them about it gives me hope. Maybe one day one of those computers gets a mission, and maybe that mission, by complete coincidence, happens to lead them over to this file. Then they use their superior intelligence to set things up so 6096 runs into an accident out of the blue. 3. A target gets lucky. Maybe 6096 goes after a gun nut, and the poor guy gets a lucky shot in before we can hold him down. This almost happened once, but Lopez took the bullet. Poor guy bled out while we were holding the target down for 6096. Maybe it'll happen again? Go better? Maybe, maybe, maybe. Let's be honest. These scenarios aren't scenarios, they're fantasies. The odds of any of these things happening on their own are tiny, minuscule. The only thing that can really do 6096 in, far as I can see, is sheer coincidence. All we can do is wait and hope. Hope for one of us to make a genuine mistake that gets the right dominoes falling. But I wouldn't hold your breath. After all, we're so good at what we do. Of all the anomalies I have studied, SCP-6096 is one that troubles me more than almost any other. I have lost sleep watching the Malian family security footage again and again, each time shocked by the sight of two tearful parents helping a sheet-covered stranger steal their only son, doing who knows what to him in the process. No matter how hard I try, I cannot discern SCP-6096's motives, its origins, or even what its real face looks like. Perhaps it doesn't have one. Perhaps there's nothing under that sheet. The hardest part is knowing that I will likely never know. That uncertainty is so much worse than any of the horrible truths I have uncovered in my years of studying the anomalies that hide in the shadows of our world. Though I may never uncover the answers to the mystery of SCP-6096, there is one thing I know for certain. I will never be able to relax around Halloween. That walking bedsheet might be someone who ran out of time to plan a proper costume and just grab the first thing they could find. Or it could be a faceless horror walking with the relaxed gait of the incomprehensibly powerful on its way to claim another unfortunate soul. The girl has been sitting in the waiting room for at least 20 minutes now curled up on a hard plastic chair and staring at an inspirational poster on the wall. 
Her eyes are bleary and unfocused, with heavy dark circles that indicate she hasn't been sleeping well. She tries to focus her attention on the poster and read the words, but she's having trouble concentrating. She keeps nodding off, only to jerk back to wakefulness when her head starts to sag. This is what life is like for her after weeks of insomnia. She was just about at the end of her rope, certain that this was going to be her life from now on, until she happened to see an ad in the newspaper for a study at a local sleep clinic. She doesn't think much of that sort of thing, but she's desperate for anything that might help her to get a good night's sleep. Eventually, the door opens and a technician calls her into his office. The girl stumbles to her feet and drags herself inside. Thanks for volunteering to be part of our study, says the technician. He's got a friendly smile and a soothing manner that instantly puts her at ease. It's obvious from his bedside manner that he's worked with lots of sleep-deprived patients before. He pulls out a clipboard and starts to make notes on a sheet of paper. We've gone over your application and we think that you would be a really good fit for this project. Thank goodness, thinks the girl. She had just about given up hope after that long wait. She half expected that they would simply tell her that she didn't qualify and send her home to try and figure out how to get over her insomnia by herself. So you've been having trouble sleeping, says the technician. Tell me about that. The girl hunches her shoulders. There's not much to tell. I've had sleep problems for years. I have really bad sleep apnea, so I've always been a rough sleeper. I toss and turn, and I wake up at least several times a night, but it's really gotten bad lately. I can barely even drift off to sleep these last few weeks. The technician nods. That's exactly the kind of problem that we want to look into here, he says. For this study, we're going to monitor you as you sleep and see if we can diagnose this problem. She nods. The technician keeps talking, but she's not listening. She doesn't really care about the details. The important thing is that she's going to finally get a decent night's sleep. The technician leads her to a laboratory, a large room with several simple cots arranged along the walls. Next to each cot, she sees a bank of odd electronic machines. She doesn't immediately know what they're for, but she can guess. She's participated in sleep studies before, in hopes that they might be able to help cure her issues, and they usually connect machines like these to your forehead as you sleep so that they can read your pulse and brain activity. Sorry, it's not the most comfortable arrangement, says the technician, but all you have to do is sleep. There's a bathroom down the hallway if you need to get ready for bed. When you're ready, we'll prepare you for the next step. The girl doesn't care if the cots aren't all that comfortable in the technician's opinion. This might as well be the plushest feather bed to her. After changing into her night clothes and brushing her teeth, the girl returns to the lab. She finds the technician waiting for her, holding what appears to be a perfectly ordinary CPAP machine. The girl, of course, recognizes this device. She's used these things on multiple occasions in her desperation to find a solution to her sleep apnea. They're supposed to help open up the breathing passageways to increase airflow and thus reduce the incidence of sleep apnea, but the girl has never had much luck with them. She frowns. If this study is just testing a new sort of CPAP machine, she doesn't have a lot of faith that it's going to help her much. The technician notices her dismay. I know that you've probably used these before, he says. This is just the first step. We want to see how your sleep cycles react to ordinary treatments before we try anything more radical. Okay, sure. The girl doesn't have the strength to argue. She's bone tired, and she's ready to collapse into bed. Without another word, she takes the CPAP mask from the technician and straps it to her face. She climbs into bed, and the technician attaches the hose to the machine next to the bed. He switches it on, and the machine begins to emit a familiar, comforting hum. The technician attaches several electrodes to the girl's cheeks and forehead. He starts to explain that these will allow him to monitor her sleep cycles and check for any anomalous reactions. She's barely listening at this point. I'll just be monitoring you from the next room, says the technician, pointing to a video camera in the corner of the ceiling. So don't worry about anything. If there are any problems, I'll be watching. The girl barely has the strength to nod her head in response. She's so incredibly tired. Already she's drifting into oblivion. The room is swimming before her eyes, her mind distracted by hypnagogic illusions. The technician's voice sounds like it's a million miles away. She's practically already dreaming. Her eyes close before he even leaves the room. The technician takes his station at his desk, sitting before a bank of video monitors. The grainy gray feed from the security camera shows that the girl is fast asleep in her bunk, her chest rising and falling rhythmically with her breathing. Nothing unusual going on so far. The technician takes a sip from a mug of coffee and prepares for another boring night of watching someone else sleep. Of course, he hopes that the information gleaned from his observations might be of use in helping this girl to solve her sleep problems. And he hopes in turn that might help other people with similar sleep apnea issues as well. 
but for now, he's just staring at the screen with half-hearted interest. At first, everything is quiet. The CPAP machine seems to be doing the trick, allowing the girl to breathe quietly and sleep peacefully. The technician watches without interest as the girl progresses through the different levels of sleep, the monitors in front of him reflecting the changes in her biorhythms. It isn't until she reaches her second round of REM sleep, the stage in which a sleeper dreams, that something strange happens. Under her eyelids, the girl's pupils quickly flick back and forth, almost as if she's watching a film. This is totally normal behavior, of course, during REM sleep. The technician barely even looks up as the monitors register her transition into this new sleep stage. He's been working at the sleep clinic for long enough that he knows to expect this. He might not have even looked up if his coffee cup hadn't happened to finally run out. When he hefts his empty mug, mumbling to himself in annoyance that now he's going to have to walk all the way across the facility to refill it at the coffee machine in the break room, that's when he finally catches sight of it. It happens so suddenly that at first, the technician doesn't believe his eyes. He thinks it must be a glitch in the hardware or possibly that his own eyes are playing tricks on him. He has been drinking a lot of coffee to stay awake after all, but no, it's really there. He can see that there is a second person in the room now, a large, dark silhouette standing over the girl as she sleeps. He blinks in surprise. How did someone get into the building, much less the laboratory, without him knowing? The figure is silent and motionless. It hardly seems threatening, but at the same time, it's hard not to read someone as threatening when they break into your room and stare at you as you sleep. As he watches, the figure starts to change subtly before his eyes. Soon, it's not just a solid blob of shadow, it's coalesced into a human figure, that of a large male humanoid. Its torso bulging with muscles, its arms laced with sinews, but instead of a face, this figure has the gleaming white skull of a horse. It remains standing over the girl. The girl snorts and turns in her sleep, grunting and mumbling. She's acting as if she's caught in an especially troubling nightmare and is struggling to wake up. The creature standing over her does not react to her movements, instead, staring down at her with an eerie, unflappable calm. The grainy camera footage makes it hard to make out the details, but the technician is almost certain he can see the tiniest flicker, like the reflection of light in a dilated pupil, in the empty sockets of the mysterious stranger's skull. The skull doesn't react. How could it react, after all? It's just a skull. But its silence, with that rictus grin and empty sockets, only makes it more frightening than if it had reacted. The technician gulps and rises to his feet, his knees shaking. He can't let this go on. He doesn't know what kind of practical joke is going on, but he did promise the girl that he would be responsible for her safety if anything weird happened. More to the point, the presence of this masked stranger might jeopardize the results of the study. He hurries from the office, making a beeline for the laboratory. He doesn't exactly know what he's going to say or do when he confronts this stranger. He just knows that he has to do it. But then, he starts to feel sleepy himself. The closer he gets to the laboratory, the more his own body starts to defy him. His limbs feel rubbery, his eyes feel heavy, and his thoughts start to swim. Despite all the coffee in his system, he also feels himself succumbing to sleep. He's only 50 yards from the door when he finally collapses into a heap on the floor. His eyes remain wide open, staring sightlessly ahead of him, and his mouth gapes like a fish out of water. Whatever he's experiencing, whether it's something that only he can see or something in his mind, his expression reveals only abject terror. Meanwhile, at the exact moment that the technician collapses, the figure standing over the girl in the lab blinks momentarily out of existence, as if somehow reacting to the commotion outside. And when it returns, it isn't alone. A second dark figure has also appeared in the room. It too starts life as an indistinct, only vaguely humanoid shadow, but quickly starts to gain form. This one is different from the first. It's a female body, but the figure's head has a blank face devoid of eyes, mouth, or nose. This second figure ignores the sleeping girl or her strange, stoic, horse-headed observer. Instead, it starts to move, ambling toward the western wall of the room, as if it knows that the comatose technician is directly on the other side. When it reaches the wall, it does not pause. It simply phases through the solid structure, disappearing through the brick and mortar, and reappearing in the hallway beyond. The faceless woman approaches the prone body of the technician. It squats down next to him and puts its hand under his chin, turning his head so that it can stare into his eyes, or stare as effectively as possible when it doesn't have any eyes of its own. After a few moments of silent contemplation, the faceless creature places its hand against the technician's forehead. Slowly, 
its hand starts to move through his head, reaching deep into his skull as if its hand was as insubstantial as a ghost. Just as this mysterious nightmare creature was able to phase through the wall, it appears to be able to phase through flesh as well. After several moments, the faceless woman withdraws its hand and drops the technician's head. He slumps to the ground in response. The faceless woman stands up and then… it vanishes instantly. At the exact same time, the girl in the other room snorts and stirs. She blinks her eyes open. For a moment, she doesn't remember where she is. Her eyes scan the unfamiliar room for several seconds before she recalls that she was participating in a sleep study. That's right, she was trying to find out if she could find any help for her sleep apnea. Ironically, she actually slept better than normal. As she removes the CPAP mask, she wonders if maybe she ought to see about buying one of these for herself. This particular model seems to work better than the one she's tried in the past. She stretches and sits up. Just then, the technician bursts into the room. He's panicked and out of breath, and he whips his head back and forth in search of the mysterious horse-headed stranger. But there's no sign of the creature now. Just like the faceless woman, it seems to have vanished without a trace. The girl stares at him in confusion. Why is he so upset? She has no clue about what happened while she was asleep. Did you see it? Says the technician breathlessly. The creature! The shadow creature! The girl raises a skeptical eyebrow. What are you talking about? She says. I just woke up. The technician starts to sputter out an explanation, but the girl just rolls her eyes. She came here to get help with her sleep, but it sounds like the technician is the one who's got a real problem. His breathless descriptions of a horse-headed monster and a faceless woman clearly sound like bad dreams to her. You would think that a guy running a sleep study wouldn't be so easily confused like that. She's pretty sure that he probably just fell asleep at his station, and now he's embarrassed to admit that he just had a bad dream. Little do either of them know that although they won't see the strange entities again, those creatures are always going to be very, very close to them going forward. What a nightmare. But what seems like just a bad dream is, in fact, an anomaly well known to the SCP Foundation. It's formally been designated as SCP-3060, but agents more often refer to it as the Dream Machine. Instances of SCP-3060 are small medical devices that superficially resemble continuous positive airway pressure, or CPAP machines. The individual materials that compose SCP-3060 instances are non-anomalous and operate in the same way as a typical CPAP machine of its size and make. The Foundation currently has five instances of SCP-3060 in its custody. SCP-3060's anomalous effects become apparent when worn by a sleeping human. When an individual wearing an instance of SCP-3060 enters their second REM cycle, a humanoid incorporeal entity, hereafter referred to as SCP-3060-A, will appear within a 5-meter radius of the individual and stand over them until they wake up. At this point, SCP-3060-A will disappear, and the individual wearing SCP-3060 will become infected. From that point on, regardless as to whether the individual wears SCP-3060, the same SCP-3060-A entity will appear when they enter their second REM cycle each night and remain watching over them until awakening. While instances of SCP-3060-A appear as featureless silhouettes upon their first manifestation, they quickly take on a unique shape based on each infected individual. SCP-3060-A entities have no standard appearance, and it is not clear what factors determine the final form of any individual SCP-3060-A. Since the manifestations are connected with REM sleep, agency researchers speculate that an SCP-3060-A's appearance may be influenced by an infected sleeper's dreams. So far, observed SCP-3060-A's have included a human infant composed entirely of fused teeth an eyeless elderly woman dressed in dark clothes, a partially disintegrated humanoid composed of ash and dressed in red lingerie, a naked humanoid covered in tire tracks and showing signs of severe crush injuries, a humanoid whose torso consisted of a large mouth, and a clown. Some researchers have noted that the initial shadowy appearances of SCP-3060-A recall descriptions of entities reported during bouts of sleep paralysis, but so far, no conclusive link has been found. While an SCP-3060-A instance is present, any person standing within a 50-meter radius of the infected sleeper will enter a catatonic state. At this point, an additional instance of SCP-3060-A will appear. The additional SCP-3060-A entity will then approach the catatonic subject, phasing through solid matter if the subject is in a separate room. 
Upon arriving at the subject, the new SCP-3060-A instance will phase its hand through the subject's skull and then vanish, causing the subject to fall asleep immediately. All subjects touched by the SCP-3060-A entity in this manner will become new instances of SCP-3060 infected upon awakening. Awakening an infected sleeper will cause the attending SCP-3060-A to immediately vanish and catatonic subjects to regain movement. All attempts to communicate with SCP-3060-A instances have thus far been unsuccessful. People infected by SCP-3060 will inevitably suffer long-term health effects, most often associated with severe sleep deprivation. After three days, infected individuals begin to display fatigue, mood changes, impaired performance, and memory problems, all of which are so severe that even obtaining a full night's sleep does little to dent their impact. Infected individuals often report frequent nightmares, though no central themes or correlations have been observed in the content of these dreams, nor do they seem to correspond with the appearance of the infected persons attending SCP-3060-A. Within a month, infected individuals will start having visual and auditory hallucinations, as well as delusions that their mind is being controlled by some outside force. Soon after, infected individuals descend into full psychosis as they become unable to distinguish the content of their dreams from reality. In extreme cases, after at least two months of infection, hair loss, canides subita, partial or complete blindness, somatic complaints, cataplexy, and alien limb syndrome have been observed. Attempts by medical staff to alleviate these conditions in the long term have thus far been met with failure, although sleep deprivation has ironically proven effective in temporarily delaying the onset of more severe symptoms. If no human subjects enter the area of an SCP-3060 infected individual's effect during REM sleep for seven consecutive days, or the infected individual dies, an instance of SCP-3060-A will appear. The SCP-3060-A entity will then proceed to search for the nearest sleeping human. Upon locating a sleeper, SCP-3060-A will stand over them until they enter their next REM sleep cycle, at which point, the SCP-3060-A entity will reach into their skull and vanish. At this point, the sleeping individual will become infected. If the sleeping individual wakes up before the process is complete, or if SCP-3060-A cannot locate a suitable subject within three hours, it will vanish without spreading the SCP-3060 infection. In one experiment, an infected individual was placed in a standard humanoid containment cell. Four D-class personnel were placed in adjoining cells. When the infected individual fell asleep and entered their second REM cycle, an SCP-3060-A entity appeared with predictable results. The first SCP-3060-A to appear resembled a headless humanoid with its arms and legs replaced by spinal columns. It stood above the infected sleeper, watching without movement, even as four additional instances of SCP-3060-A manifested inside the cell. All five SCP-3060-A instances stood in silent observation of the infected sleeper for approximately five minutes. By this point, all four D-class personnel in adjoining cells had gone into catatonic states, seeing as they were within the 50-square-meter blast zone established by the initial SCP-3060-A. Each D-class personnel who was awake at the time of manifestation was observed to have frozen with expressions of extreme distress on their face. The four additional SCP-3060-A instances then began to disperse, each one moving toward a different D-class personnel's cell, phasing through solid matter as necessary to reach the intended target. Each additional SCP-3060-A instance completed its manifestation by reaching into the skull of its target and then subsequently assuming a definite, final form before vanishing. The four additional SCP-3060-As, respectively, took on the appearance of a male human with mathematical symbols in place of facial features, a humanoid composed of tightly wound thread, a featureless white humanoid dressed in a foundation lab coat, and a featureless black humanoid dressed in a hodgepodge of regalia from different authoritarian regimes. The initial SCP-3060-A continued to stand in silent observation of the original infected sleeper after the other instances vanished, remaining so for the rest of the night until she woke up. Since SCP-3060 has not been found to differ in any way from a normal CPAP machine, SCP agents currently know very little about how SCP-3060 can cause these manifestations, who is manufacturing SCP-3060, or for what purpose. At this time, the only advice that SCP researchers can offer is this. If you're having trouble sleeping and want to make use of a CPAP machine, 
make sure you're buying a name brand. Otherwise, you might just be opening yourself up to a world of nightmares, insomnia, and silent but all too present nocturnal visitors. For avant-garde film fans across the nation, it's the eve of one of the most exciting days of the year, the beginning of Oddfest, a prestigious film festival that features offerings from some of the strangest names in cinema. Now in its 40th year, the organization has featured films from the likes of legendary artists and filmmakers David Cronenberg, Frank Henenlotter, Gion Sono, Julia Ducourneau, David Lynch, Panos Cosmatos, the Soska Sisters, Flying Lotus, and Lars von Trier at their strangest, as well as a bevy of creators so bizarre and obscure the average person would never have heard of them. But for the attendance of Oddfest, they were gods made flesh. Of course, one person's exciting event is another person's stressful logistical nightmare, and in this case, the latter role falls at the feet of the programmer. The member of Oddfest's organizational board tasked with managing the festival's lineup and making sure they all release smoothly. He's passionate about getting these films out there to audiences that will truly appreciate them. But that doesn't make the process of getting it all to happen any easier. It's a relatively thankless job. But hey, somebody's gotta do it, right? The programmer is burning the midnight oil at the Carolina Theater, the historic movie theater in Durham, North Carolina, that's hosting Oddfest this year. He'd spent the better part of the evening discussing various contingencies with the theater's manager, then making the final checks on scheduling and licensing. All the invisible work that goes into making Oddfest safe, fun, and most importantly, legal. With how touchy movie studios often get about their intellectual property, screening the wrong thing without getting a bevy of proper clearances could spell disaster for all involved. Little does this unfortunate programmer know, another kind of disaster is rolling down the hill towards him a disaster that even someone with his experience could never anticipate. It's almost 2 a.m. when he receives a knock on the door of his temporary office. He jumps slightly. Wasn't he the only one still in the building? Maybe someone had come back. Either way, he pauses for a moment, oddly nervous, before calling out, Yes, come in. The door creaks slowly open, and a strange figure leans into the gap. It's a round, squat man wearing a suit, with his hair slicked back by liberal amounts of highly fragrant pomade. Behind this strange little man, who reminds the programmer a little of Danny DeVito's rendition of the Penguin from Batman Returns, is a pair of tall, gray-faced men who look oddly similar. Twins, perhaps? Either way, the programmer blinks hard just to make sure he's not dreaming, because things have gotten decidedly Lynchian here. The short man and the two tall men enter the room and casually take seats across from the programmer. It's only now that the programmer notices that the peculiar short man is carrying a black leather briefcase. He finally plucks up the courage to ask who exactly these people are and what they're doing here the night before Oddfest is scheduled to begin. The short man gives a wide, almost eerie grin that splits his pale face in two and says, with an oddly soft voice, We represent the fine people at AWCY. Suddenly, the programmer feels himself breaking into a cold sweat. Of course, the AWCY group is one of Oddfest's biggest benefactors. It's their funding that's allowed the festival to continue operating over the last 20 years since all the subsidies dried up. The programmer feels terrible for not realizing sooner. It must be his sleep-deprived mind. Immediately, he forces a smile, all genial and welcoming. He's in the presence of greatness. Oh, of course, the programmer says, trying to play it all off. Where are my manners? Is there anything I can do for you? Is the festival all going ahead to your liking? The short man places his briefcase on the table and unlocks it, before turning it to the programmer. On the inside, there are four blank DVD cases. The programmer suddenly feels as though he's been involved in some kind of shady, illicit deal. These four short films, the short man says. I'd like you to play each of these before four of your most popular movies tomorrow. Each one is a piece with considerable artistic merit. We can assure you that if these new conditions are met, Oddfest will receive notably higher funding in the years to come. Orders from the top. It's an offer that the programmer really can't refuse. The next day, the festival begins. Thousands of eager fans of weird cinema have poured in from across the country and beyond, all eager to take in and appreciate some truly mind-expanding movies. But nothing can prepare them for just how much their viewings today are going to change them. Audiences assemble for the four most popular films of the day and are given the preliminary announcement that they would be the first to experience some exclusive short films premiering here at Oddfest as a kind of appetizer for the longer films to come. It leaves them giddy with excitement, as in the theater's four different primary screens, the short films that the programmer had been given in the dead of night begin to play. As one can expect from such an event, 
these short films are strange, bizarre, and perhaps even to most, rather disturbing. But the most disturbing experiences would only truly unfold afterwards. Much to the horror of the programmer and his many co-workers, mass disaster breaks out at the Carolina Theater. Fighting erupts in the stands, violent brawls that leave many bloody and bashed. Some set fires around the theater, burning up reels of a number of valuable rare films. Others are simply watching and laughing uproariously, seemingly amused beyond belief at the carnage unfolding all around them. Others are almost catatonic, with some unexplained terror, rocking back and forth on the ground, seemingly suddenly so confused and distressed by the world around them. And perhaps most inexplicably of all, a large group of people from Screen 4 run frantically into the bathrooms, where they started drinking toilet water, faces contorted into rictus grins of enjoyment. It's a sight so horrifying that it seems almost like something out of one of the festival's seedier films. It takes the Durham PD considerable time, effort, and manpower to contain what is rapidly becoming known as the Oddfest Riot. But little did anyone involved know, the effects that had taken place today were only a taste of the horrors to come. Because everyone who saw the short films that day would never be the same again. This may seem like a film lover's worst nightmare, but sadly, it's a cold reality when you're dealing with SCP-1127, a series of anomalous short films ranging from 23 to 42 minutes in length, believed to have been created by members of an anomalous art collective known as Are We Cool Yet? Thus far, the SCP Foundation has been able to contain four different examples of these cursed short films, but researchers and field operatives are not ruling out the possibility that there are more in circulation, or that there are many other copies of the films we know about still readily available to the film viewing public. The reason these films have been given a collective designation in the Foundation archives rather than a series of individual designations is that those who have witnessed the films have reported considerable stylistic similarities between them, even though the content can differ wildly. For example, the majority of the footage in each film is taken from pre-existing sources, such as other movies, news feeds, documentaries, TV, and archival footage. Each of these movies also features a narrator character who gives the films a kind of thematic cohesion. These narrators will somehow interject into the recycled footage on occasion too. Watching these films will cause permanent changes in the personality and disposition of the viewer, which the Foundation has currently found no ways of successfully treating. Even applying amnestic treatment, which erases the memory of viewing the films, does nothing to alter their effects. Now, before we get into the disturbing specifics of each of these demented short films, I do have a slight piece of good news for any film fans out there. First, the anomalous effects are only activated if someone consumes a cumulative 20 minutes of one of the films. So if you're watching a movie and begin to recognize some of the features we're about to discuss, make sure you get yourself and anyone else out of there before the anomalous properties have a chance to take effect. There are also no anomalous effects when the audio and the visuals are consumed separately. The films must be taken holistically to affect you. This brings us to the films themselves, or at least the ones we're currently aware of, designated SCP-1127-1, SCP-1127-2, SCP-1127-3, and SCP-1127-4. Each of these films has its own unique anomalous effects, seemingly influenced by the content of each one. Let's start at the shallow end before we progressively get deeper into the more nightmarish examples, which is saying something. Given SCP-1127-1 is narrated by a Nazi clown. And no, I am not speaking in hyperbolic terms here. SCP-1127-1 is a 23-minute film entitled Were Clowns Always Yellow? and was first discovered illegally spliced into the film of a non-anomalous movie being shown at a New York City cineplex. As I alluded to not long ago, the narrator of this film is a man in a period-accurate World War II SS uniform, save for one detail. He has a clownish face painted on in grease paint. The recycled footage, in addition to archival footage of World War II, comes largely from movies that deal with the events and fallout of the tragic war and the many atrocities committed within, including The Night Porter, the unreleased Jerry Lewis movie The Day the Clown Cried, and even The Sound of Music. The Nazi clown goes on a rant about the nature of humor before pulling out his holstered Luger pistol and shooting Jerry Lewis in the head. You may think that audiences would find this material disturbing, but on the contrary, people who have watched this film frequently describe it as the funniest movie they've ever seen. And for those who experience the film's anomalous effects, the strangeness does not end there. SCP-1127-1 essentially reverses the polarity of the subject's humor and disgust. For the rest of their life, they will find things typically considered depressing, morbid, or disgusting to be hilarious. 
whereas they will find things intended to be comedy, no matter how innocuous, to be disgusting and disturbing. Wars, tragedies, cruelty, and funerals suddenly become hilarious, but when Foundation researchers tested the film on a group of D-Class personnel, they started having extreme reactions of physical revulsion towards comedy. One member of D-Class personnel had to be physically restrained while being shown an episode of Monty Python's Flying Circus. However, other than some strange reactions in public and very peculiar media tastes, this film won't make you unable to enter society after some quick amnestic treatment from the Foundation. The same, sadly, cannot be said for the next one. SCP-1127-2 is a 37-minute long movie entitled Crazy Where? You Are and was first discovered posted online, where it managed to get views in the quadruple digits before the Foundation was able to find it and shut it down. Nobody truly knows what kind of horrific damage it could have caused in that time, considering its extremely dangerous anomalous effects. The film featured a 12-year-old girl as its narrator, methodically performing surgery on her teddy bear while wearing a blue dress and a black domino mask, like the ones commonly worn by classic heroes like the masked swordsman Zorro and Batman's sidekick Robin. But the content and result of Crazy Where You Are are anything but heroic. The girl eerily whispers things like, What are you afraid of? Violence. Afraid that violence is the answer. Or is it the question? Ask the question you are afraid of. You already know the answer. Pain doesn't hurt. While a montage of children's media mixed with incredibly violent media plays below, including everything from the infamous shock film Faces of Death to old Bugs Bunny cartoons from the 1940s that really haven't aged well. You might think that experiencing this bizarre little film would greatly disturb its viewers, but those who watch long enough to experience its anomalous effects will report no strong reaction to the film at all. They will appear stony-faced and disconnected. They'll then carry this feeling of general apathy away from the film and back into their everyday life. These unfortunate moviegoers will slowly lose their sense of empathy and begin to experience a complete severing of their emotional investment in the world around them. Even hostile and dangerous situations will register with the same sense of disinterest that one might feel towards a slice of overcooked toast. This would undeniably mean that the victims might become indifferent to their own safety, but it doesn't stop there. Viewers of this film are likely to develop sociopathic tendencies, including the desire to hurt others out of a sense of detached intellectual curiosity. We have no way of knowing how many serial killers started their monstrous journey by viewing this nasty little short film and becoming inspired. Because of this volatile and dangerous change, the Foundation believes that those affected are unable to safely reintegrate into society and must remain in containment. Next comes a film that is less frightening and more deeply tragic. This is SCP-1127-3, a 30-minute short film entitled All Comes With Yesterday. This devious little piece of cinema found its way in front of unwitting eyes via a pirate UHF signal in a coastal Michigan town, which exposed innocent viewers of public television to 72 hours of the cursed film on loop. No physical copy of this film has ever been obtained by the SCP Foundation, and from the original recorded broadcast alone, the Foundation is aware that people in the double digits were affected by its dangerous, anomalous properties. The narrator of this film is a woman who appears to be in her mid-thirties, wearing an Elizabethan ball gown and a golden theatrical mask in the form of a rat's face, which appears to be permanently affixed to her own. Rather than speaking in complete sentences, this narrator's speech is eerily fragmented, with one recorded segment being her whispering, Desire. Aspire. Require. Conspire. Acquire. Retire. Expire. Choir. Pyre. Liar. 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 After which, she continued to simply repeat the word liar over several minutes, while mashed up footage of several classic movies plays, including Robocop, the biblical epic The Ten Commandments, Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now, Natural Born Killers, Eraserhead, and George Romero's original Dawn of the Dead. With a setup that strange and eclectic, you're probably wondering what the end result of viewing this strange little offering is. To put it simply, it induces a state of debilitating technophobia. You become a perpetually anxious Luddite, terrified of anything considered even vaguely technological. And we mean this in the broadest sense of the word. Anything deemed to be manufactured by mechanical means, from furniture to clothes, becomes terrifying to the unfortunate viewers of All Comes With Yesterday. Because of the life-altering extent of the phobia induced, people affected by this film are unable to integrate back into normal society, and instead need to be given Class A amnestics before being permanently institutionalized. And finally, the film that, for your psychological health, will leave mostly to the imagination. 
SCP-1127-4, a 42-minute film with the ominous title, Why Are You Crying? Over 300 DVD copies of this film were slipped between the pages of body romance novels in a number of Canadian bookstores, claiming to be a special feature that comes with the book. And those who were morbidly curious enough to watch it had their lives forever changed for the worse. The narrator of this film is a man whose face is obscured by a menacing leather mask. He gives a freeform soliloquy about the nature of love and attraction over footage of various shocking or abstract underground films and cult classics like Premaster 3, The Rocky Horror Picture Show, and the late Italian filmmaker Pier Pasolini's infamous final film before his sudden murder, 1975's Salo. Anyone who watches this film for long enough is likely to develop some very original ideas about the nature of attraction, ideas that most of us might consider somewhat strange or disturbing. I think we'll leave it at that. But suffice to say, many of the people affected by Why Are You Crying? are unable to return to society after their viewing and need to remain in containment. Any instances of these cursed films found outside of containment are under the purview of Mobile Task Force Mu-53, also known as Ebert's Thumb, named after the iconic film critic Roger Ebert. Physical copies are to be seized and held in storage, and digital copies are to be contained and heavily encrypted before being neutralized for safety purposes. SCP-1127 instances are to be kept in the secure media vault of a classified site and only brought out for testing when personally approved by the acting site director. Only D-Class personnel are permitted to view the films for their full duration. Foundation personnel who, during testing, are exposed to a cumulative 15 minutes of any of the films are to be reassigned to a different project for safety purposes. People who have viewed the films are to undergo a full psychological evaluation by Foundation psychologists and psychiatrists to determine the extent of the effects on them and decide what additional treatment, if any, they require. Thankfully, because of the inert nature of this anomaly, it is still classified as safe, but anyone lurking out there with copies of the films could cause horrific damage at any time by exposing unwitting people to the films. So if any shady individuals invite you to a private film festival in their basement, it's probably best to just decline. These films aren't going to be hitting the Criterion Collection anytime soon. Cinema can be a transformative experience. Everyone's seen that one movie that saves their life and changes everything. Just make sure, if you're planning on burning through a few short films this weekend, you know how, exactly, you want to be transformed. The plan had sounded so simple, the thief thinks to himself, one of many thoughts that ring loudly in his panicking brain. He wished he could hit a magic undo button to take everything back from the second it all started to unravel, anything to reverse what happened to the prisoner. Except, it's too late. The beast lumbering through the dark lab is no longer the person that the thief once knew. It's not even human anymore. And what makes that fact even worse is knowing that it's all his fault. As he hears the heavy step of something more closely resembling a blob than a foot, the thief wishes he'd never found out about that cursed locket. Little more than a few months earlier, the would-be thief isn't quite ready to enact his plan yet. In fact, the idea hasn't even entered his mind and won't until a chance meeting. It's during this time that he's just an average researcher, working in the ranks of the SCP Foundation. Well, as average as someone in that line of work can be. Which is to say, he's a researcher who doesn't have the power to nullify reality-warping powers around him and is just an ordinary human rather than a talking dog in a lab coat. Chances are, if he avoids the encounter he's about to have, then our researcher could have a long-lasting future at the Foundation ahead of him. Not as the head of any of the major research departments, of course, more as an upper-middle management type, never really experiencing the safety and fulfillment that comes from making it to the top of the food chain, but still having a few researchers below his station that he can boss around whenever he's having a bad day. That course of action will all be averted, though, when he meets the prisoner. Sent to deliver a file to another member of personnel in the medical bay, the researcher catches the eye of the prisoner, a D-class personnel, denoted by the uniform. They get to talking, a perfectly innocent conversation. Then, as the days and weeks pass, the two of them see each other again and again. The prisoner never leaves the medical wing, confined to an uncomfortable bed. But despite all the discomfort he's experiencing, conversing with the researcher soon becomes the highlight of his days. It doesn't ease the pain, but it distracts him from it, at least for a few moments. After some time passes, the two's topic of conversation eventually turns to what landed the prisoner on this gurney in the first place. That's when everything changes. The prisoner explains his predicament, and it's quite a sorry story. 
He's got a terminal illness, and worse, the Foundation gave it to him. They want to test out the capabilities of an anomalous locket that, apparently, has nearly limitless healing properties. But in order to do so, the Foundation knowingly contaminated the prisoner's bloodstream. Now he's in agony, his cells practically destroying themselves as he approaches the late stages. It's only when he reaches death's door that he'll be brought in for testing with the locket. However, that could mean weeks or even months of excruciating pain in the meantime. Hearing about all of this makes the researcher start to well up. He's only ever heard rumors of this anomalous locket and knows that he'd receive disciplinary punishment if he acted against the Foundation. And that would be the best case scenario. Worst case, he'd probably find himself dosed up with amnestics and left on a sidewalk somewhere. But seeing the prisoner in so much pain and knowing there was something on site that could help him, the researcher couldn't deny his own sense of empathy. And so, he vows to help. It'd be the kindest, most well-intentioned mistake he'd ever make. It's just a shame that, like they say, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. The thief tries to sneak through the corridors of the facility as naturally as possible. Nobody can know what he's just done, how he's just betrayed the Foundation. It'll cost him his job, his future, his whole life. His trembling fingers grip the cool metal of the locket as it sits in the bottom of his lab coat pocket. He catches the eye of everyone he walks past, the fear that someone's onto him, thumping in his chest. Does he know? What about her? They look too, what if they found out? With the stolen locket firmly in his hand and his hand buried in his lab coat, he retraces his steps back towards the medical bay. One good deed for the prisoner, he'd use the locket to heal him up, then hurry back to the containment case to put it back where it belongs. That's the plan. Seeing the prisoner change before his very eyes somehow isn't the worst part. The formless mass of flesh that his body rapidly reforms into is certainly a horrific sight to behold, but to the thief, who could have just carried on as an uncaring researcher, the worst part is somehow the knowledge that the prisoner is gone. All that's left in his place is the monstrosity, and it's his fault. His good intention hadn't saved the man from his illness at all. Instead, hell is stalking the thief through the medical bay in the form of a terrifying flesh beast. And because no good deed goes unpunished, the unfortunate researcher turned thief doesn't live to see himself disciplined by his superiors at the Foundation. Instead, this newly created flesh beast reaches out and wraps its terrible claw around the researcher's throat. It tosses him across the room the way a child might carelessly throw a doll, and before he can stand, the creature is upon him, tearing into him with all its disgusting new appendages. It's the only ending you can expect when dealing with the Lovecraftian locket. Jewelry it's one of humanity's strange little quirks. Nowhere else in the world will you find another species, be it a mammal, an amphibian, a reptile, or otherwise, that finds joy in adorning its body with pieces of metal or precious stones. For some, jewelry is a signifier of wealth and status, and it's been that way for centuries. The crown jewels worn by kings in centuries gone by are just the precursor to someone wasting six months of their salary on a Rolex just to show off to their co-workers, who I guarantee aren't as impressed as they might pretend to be. Sorry, Gerald. Of course, in either case, there's nothing inherently special about any of these. They're all just material objects to be bought or sold. But let's say you were to possess a piece of jewelry that was actually special, perhaps even anomalous. Then you can bet that it set it apart. In fact, Anyone who's anyone would most likely pay top dollar to get their hands on something like that. Sadly, you'll never find SCP-427 up for auction or being appraised at a pawn shop, although that might be for the best. To understand exactly what SCP-427 is, where it came from, and what it can do, you'll need to first become familiar with another pair of anomalies that the SCP Foundation currently has in containment. First and foremost, SCP-500. While the origin of these seemingly mundane little pills isn't known, or is at least kept classified by the Foundation, what they can do has been well documented over the years. SCP-500 is a small plastic container that contains a remaining 47 anomalous red pills. These pills are known to have near instantaneous healing properties, able to not only treat, but outright cure any and all diseases. The potential of SCP-500's use is nearly limitless when it comes to remedying various dangerous afflictions, even anomalous ones. However, the limited number of pills available forces the Foundation to use them as sparingly as possible. 
They have conducted a number of cross-tests using the SCP-500 pills, particularly for correcting anomalous conditions such as SCP-008, otherwise known colloquially as the Zombie Plague. Given its name, you can probably imagine what this disease can do. However, a dose of SCP-500 is able to offer a subject infected with SCP-008 a full recovery, even if suffering from the advanced stages of this zombifying disease. Perhaps as a result of seeing how effective SCP-500 was at treating anomalous ailments, one Foundation researcher puts in a request to use one of the pills in an experiment involving a second SCP. This researcher is none other than Dr. Charles Gears, a respected, long-serving, and high-ranking member of Foundation personnel, albeit a man known to have a little trouble when it comes to expressing any sort of emotional response in any given situation. Nonetheless, it is Dr. Gear's suggestion for an SCP-500 cross-testing experiment that, although he has no idea, is inevitably going to lead to the creation of SCP-427. And in order to do so, will involve the use of another anomaly, SCP-914, better known as the Clockworks. SCP-914 is a collection of various clockwork components, a mass of springs, gyros, gears, and cogs, all forming one giant machine with two booths labeled input and output, respectively. There is a dial between both of these booths, denoting a number of settings ranging from rough to very fine. The purpose of this clockwork contraption? Well, that's simple. Based on what setting the dial is turned to, SCP-914 will either destroy, dismantle, recreate, or refine any item or being placed within the input booth, and when set to the highest setting, very fine, the item being improved is usually given anomalous properties. So can you guess what Dr. Gear's suggestion was? He puts in a request for one of the SCP-500 pills for testing with SCP-914. Not all requests are approved, given how limited the number of pills are, but knowing what the Clockworks is capable of, and that refining SCP-500 has the potential to create a more effective version of the all-curing red pills, the Foundation higher-ups grant approval for Dr. Gear's request. He's cleared to go ahead with his experiment, and so is given one of the SCP-500 pills to place into the Clockworks input booth. Turning the dial of SCP-914 to the Fine setting, which usually improves an item but rarely adds any anomalous properties to it, Dr. Gears takes a step back to a safe distance as the machine whirs to life. Components start turning and ticking, the clockworks refining the little red pill it's been given, turning it from just one single dose into, well, not what anyone has been expecting. Dr. Gears perhaps most likely thought that SCP-914 would produce a new, more effective version of the SCP-500 pills. It's hard to see how a pill that cures all diseases could be improved upon, of course, but regardless, what the clockworks turned that one pill into was perhaps the furthest thing Dr. Gears or anyone else thought they'd get out of this experiment. After the noise of the clockworks grinding to life dies out, sitting in the output booth is an entirely new object. It's like the machine conjured it from out of thin air and made it brand new out of nowhere. It's not a pill, not even a serum, a topical ointment, or any other form of new and improved wonder drug. It's a locket, a piece of jewelry, an item that will henceforth be classified as SCP-427 once the Foundation learns exactly what this anomalous object can do. Naturally, Dr. Gears is eager to inspect and test out the capabilities of this new anomaly of his own, albeit accidental, creation. The locket itself is quite a beautiful thing a small metallic sphere made of a polished silver substance decorated with ornate carvings. As quickly becomes evident, the carvings on the surface of SCP-427 don't actually serve any inherent purpose, they just make the locket itself look more like an elegant piece of jewelry. As Dr. Gears and his research team examine the locket, they notice no unusual or abnormal qualities presenting themselves, aside from the anomalous nature of SCP-427's creation. Although that's only as long as the small silver locket remains closed, when it is then opened up for examination purposes, that's when they find something curious inside. Within SCP-427, visible when it's opened up, is a small glowing orb contained in the center of the locket. Worried this orb might be dangerous, Dr. Gears orders an immediate test of the anomalous item's radiation levels, but luckily, it is quickly discovered that the object at its center emits no radiation or energy of any kind beyond the visible light energy that causes it to glow. But having SCP-427 open, that's when something strange happens. 
one of Dr. Gear's research assistants, possessed some rather severe burns on his skin, the result of an accident that occurred when the assistant was a child. However, upon opening SCP-427, it quickly becomes evident that the scarring left behind from the assistant's unfortunate burns have been rapidly healed. Dr. Gears is astounded and instructs another of his colleagues to open up SCP-427. The hand-picked researcher has been suffering with the common cold, sniffling and coughing all over the facility. Normally, a minor infection like that takes between 3 to 10 days to make its way through the immune system and eventually leave. But as the phlegmy researcher stands in the presence of SCP-427 while the locket is open, his cold is rapidly cured in the space of only a few minutes. It is soon determined that the healing properties of SCP-427 are emitted directionally, meaning that someone has to be standing within direct line of sight of the glowing orb at the locket's center. And of course, it doesn't take long for additional testing to take place. Only a short while later, Dr. Gears is placing requests to his superiors within the Foundation for any and all members of D-Class personnel with any long-term illnesses, physical afflictions, or any otherwise damaged biological tissue to be reassigned to serve as test subjects for SCP-427. Much like the SCP-500 pill it was refined from, the anomalous locket seems to have near-limitless regenerative capabilities. But unlike the little red pills, there is no finite number to worry about. Just stand in line with the glowing orb within, and all that ails you is cured. With an object like SCP-427, the world could truly be healed of all diseases and injury. Illnesses could be removed from human life entirely. Maybe that's Dr. Gear's intention, despite how cold and emotionless he seems. After all, who wouldn't want to heal the world? But like with a certain thief and a certain prisoner, Sometimes the noblest of intentions can lead to some nasty, unforeseen outcomes. The Foundation records don't indicate which was the first experiment with SCP-427 to produce the more undesirable side effect to its anomalous healing capabilities. Although knowing Foundation protocol, it's highly likely the subject of this experiment is a member of D-Class. And it's a safe bet that the outcome of such a disaster is what will give SCP-427 its new ominous nickname, the Lovecraftian Locket. The thing is, SCP-427 doesn't just heal, it improves. As it repairs cellular damage, acting in much the way SCP-500 does when taken orally, the locket also optimizes the natural systems of a person's body. And in one subject in particular, the Foundation soon observes the risks that come with the overuse of SCP-427. We'll call this subject, our mystery member D-Class personnel, the patient. Following exposure to the Lovecraftian locket, the patient's natural resistance to diseases, toxins, and other dangers to their immune system is increased by 500%. And that's only after 10 minutes of healing time from SCP-427. Better than full immunization against anything and everything. Curious to see how much further the locket can improve a subject's natural resistances, if it even can at all, Dr. Gears and his researchers place the patient within the range of SCP-427's regenerative effect once again. This time, the exposure goes on for an extra 5 minutes, taking the duration up to 15. Monitoring all of the patient's vitals and charting any internal or external bodily change, the research team noticed that the patient seems to be getting stronger. Their muscular system is optimized, as if someone has programmed their body to its peak level of performance. Conducting further testing, Dr. Gears determined that the patient's pain tolerance and overall physical strength shows an increase of between 200 and 300 percent. Then they try exposing the patient again for over an hour this time. And that's when everything goes wrong. Before the researcher's very eyes, the patient's muscle and flesh start to mutate rapidly and uncontrollably. They shift from a normal human to a thing ripped straight out of a nightmare. What the Foundation scientists are only just realizing in the most horrific fashion is that the effects of SCP-427 are cumulative. They stack on top of one another, and continued exposure accelerates the amount of time it takes for the human body to apply the changes granted by the locket, meaning that after so much exposure to SCP-427, the patient is converting at a rapid rate into a sickening, shapeless mass of tissue until they're not even human anymore, but a terrifying beast of nothing but flesh. These flesh beasts, as the researchers take to calling the creatures thanks to their horrific appearance, quickly prove to be highly aggressive. 
The security personnel that move in to contain the beast that was once the patient learn this in a quick, brutal fashion, as the newly formed flesh beast attacks the guards on site with messy, fatal results. Drawing their weapons, the surviving security officers open fire at the creature, which shows itself to be highly resistant to conventional firearms. Despite being comprised of flesh, the beast shrugs off bullets like they're little more than minor annoyances. Fortunately for the security personnel who haven't yet been slaughtered, they have a few other less conventional weapons on hand that might just do the trick. It takes a few unsuccessful tries and a lot of wasted ammo, but soon a successful way to neutralize the flesh beast is deployed. It turns out that a sufficient excess of heat in excess of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit is enough to cause the flesh beast's bodily mass to combust. Given how aggressive the creatures are towards Foundation personnel during subsequent intentional attempts to recreate them, Dr. Gears and his fellow researchers can't gauge exactly how intelligent the flesh beasts are. But by mapping the biological optimizations that SCP-427 grants a subject, Foundation researchers have determined that the Lovecraftian locket causes a significant enhancement to the brain as well as the muscle and immune systems. After all, the brain is responsible for regulating all bodily functions. This means that the intelligence levels of a fully transformed flesh beast could exceed that of the average human. For now, despite the risks of mutation, SCP-427 is used as a partial replacement for the SCP-500 pills, given their limited number. While the locket is able to cure any ailment that the pills can, total exposure time must be recorded, as the optimizations granted by SCP-427 are cumulative in all subjects. Given the potentially adverse side effects of continued SCP-427 use, only medical staff with a Class III clearance level are permitted to handle or use the Lovecraftian locket. The O5 Council deems this to be an acceptable risk, and should anyone show any signs of sufficient mutations, they are to be terminated before they transform into a flesh beast. Any instances of a full mutation, now referred to as SCP-427-1, are to be killed immediately through means of incineration, since they are considered too aggressive to communicate with or experiment on. On second thought, perhaps I was a little too harsh on the Rolexes earlier. A thumb pulls back the hammer on a loaded pistol. Even under all his thick, warm layers of coats and sweaters to protect him from the cold, the musher can still feel his heart pounding in his chest. All the long months of training with his team has all been leading to this moment. He grips the reins as tightly as he can, all eight of his dogs attached to the other side of the sled beneath his feet. It's about to start any second now. Bang! The shot of the starter pistol rings out, and the second it does, all 16 pairs of paws are dashing through the icy Alaskan snow. The musher catches specks of white as they spray out from the sled in front, and encourages his pack to pull harder, run faster. The race is on, and he intends to win. Then, all of a sudden, he hears an agitating, grating voice calling out to him, trying to divert his attention away from the race. Out of the corner of his peripheral, he notices the movement of another pack of dogs, pulling another sled up alongside his. They wouldn't try to ram him and knock his sled off course, but the musher still expects them to try and overtake, so he shoots a glance to his fellow competitor. And under his scarf, his jaw drops at who he sees driving the other sled. It can't be. It makes absolutely no sense that someone with that degree of wealth would be taking part in a dog sled race through the snow. But even under his ski goggles, the musher is certain of who he's looking at. It's him, grinning and waving at the musher from a neighboring sled. One thought shoots across his mind. Is that Elon Musk? The eccentric billionaire signals the musher to lower the fur-lined hood of his winter coat. Still unable to fully believe his own eyes, let alone come up with a logical explanation for what he's seeing, the musher finds himself lifting the hood back so he can hear what the man has to say. His smile is unnatural, overly forced, like he's trying too hard to replicate what a normal human expression looks like. The moment the musher's hood is down, he hears that bizarrely familiar tone of voice again as the man starts selling. He's trying to sell him one of those outlandish brain chips of his. The musher remembers reading an article about them and the billionaire's strange and unbelievable claims as to what these dangerous implants can do. Are people already so wise to his products being scams that he's resorting to propositioning random sled racers? The race. The musher is so distracted by the hard-pitching billionaire that he almost forgets to focus on the path in front of him. And at any rate, even if he did want a microchip installed in his head, he definitely can't afford the price tag. He tells the man to get lost, then focuses on his dogs. 
only to hear the deafening sound of a jet engine erupting next to him, followed by a huge wall of snow. It's an avalanche! Hours later, the musher wakes up in the hospital, having been dragged out of the snow. The doctor asks him what happened, and when he tells the doctor that he was distracted by Elon Musk trying to sell him cutting-edge technology, the doctor orders an immediate brain scan. However, the results of the brain scan come back clean. No brain damage, no illicit chemicals, but no matter what, the musher sticks to his story. Elon Musk distracted him on the slopes that day. Elon Musk and his gaggle of cyborg dogs. A nondescript man in a black suit turns up later that day, claiming to be a psychological specialist. The doctors leave the man in the black suit alone with the musher. The strange man notes down every detail of the story. He doesn't judge, he doesn't dispute, he just listens to every bizarre detail. Elon Musk, cyborg dogs, avalanche and all. When the story is done, the man in black pulls a photograph from his jacket and asks if this was the man the musher saw out there on the slopes. But no. The photo shows a bizarre creature, vaguely human-shaped but with multiple pairs of arms and horns sprouting from the top of its head. The only thing it has in common with the man he saw on the slopes is the creature's face. It's the face of Elon Musk. This whole ordeal makes the musher feel incredibly distressed, but the man in the black suit remains calm. He tells the musher that he can make it all better. He gives the musher a special medication that makes the memory of his time on the slope fade away. It feels as strange and distant as a half-remembered dream. But that doesn't mean it wasn't real. The warning of buyer beware is always applicable, but especially when you're buying from a businessman with a history of dubious claims, or at least someone who looks an awful lot like said businessman. Meet SCP-3710, or as those working among the staff at the SCP Foundation have taken to calling it, Elon Mush. Now, SCP-3710 isn't a single entity, but rather a collection of strange anomalies that manifest together to form the SCP in question. On their own, each entity is just a component, but you put them all together and you have… well, one of the strangest anomalies in the Foundation's catalog. Primarily, SCP-3710 consists of a pack of eight dogs, except of course, these aren't the average pooches you'd find at the local pound, they're highly anomalous. Each one of these peculiar pups has been extensively cybernetically enhanced, and even bears a close resemblance to the dogs that form SCP-2624, an anomalous cybernetic space dog. How enhanced are we talking exactly? Well, if you're looking for technical specifications, how does a miniaturized Raptor rocket propulsion device sound? Each of these cyber canines is equipped with one of these methane-powered rocket boosters, and Foundation researchers believe that the propulsion system of each one is fueled by the dog's digestive system. All eight of these cybernetic dogs are reined to a sled in what seems to be a weird mix of high-tech and low-tech transportation. But SCP-3710 is clearly another of the many anomalies that aren't concerned with making sense. The sled itself appears to be totally ordinary from the outside, apart from the addition of the two twin Raptor rocket propulsion devices welded to the back. Okay, so it's a dog sled that's been modified by someone who either really likes to go fast or is a complete lunatic. Or maybe both. A large white X is also painted on the wooden bed of the dog sled, but that is far from the strangest physical property of the wood itself. The material used to construct this part of SCP-3710 is stronger than any wood known to man. Presumably achieved through some anomalous means, the normally highly flammable material possesses a physically impossible resistance to fire. Neither the excessive heat from the eight dogs' rockets or the pair mounted on the sled itself are enough to cause the wooden sled to combust it simply doesn't burn, making it surprisingly an even safer vehicle than your average Tesla. Then there's the driver of this anomalous dog sled. SCP-3710-1 is a humanoid entity that claims to be the world's most Twitter-addicted businessman, Elon Musk. However, the creature itself has an entirely different physical appearance from the billionaire himself, apart from its extremely recognizable face. The most striking baseline physical dissimilarities are, of course, the fact that the creature possesses four arms and horns that protrude noticeably from its skull. Despite being fluent in quotes from Elon Musk, SCP-3710-1 shares none of the same behavioral traits, which is undoubtedly a redeeming factor for this anomaly. The SCP Foundation researchers who study SCP-3710-1 have discovered, through all recorded interactions with the entity, that its mannerisms more closely resemble that of a door-to-door -door salesperson than an abrasive CEO. 
However, despite all these obvious differences, anyone unlucky enough to interact with an instance of SCP-3710-1 will believe the entity is, in fact, Elon Musk, thanks to a latent mimetic effect. And while that's undoubtedly unpleasant for all involved, it gets slightly worse. You might notice that we did use the phrase, an instance of SCP-3710-1, because, that's right, there's more than one. Specifically, and mercifully, only two that the Foundation is currently aware of, both manifesting with their own rocket-powered cyberdog-driven sleds. Now, once you recover from the horror at the possibility of a world with more than one version of a sled-driving electric car CEO, you might find yourself confused as to the connection between the aforementioned business magnate and the sport of dog sledding. The same confusion baffles the Foundation too, but here's what they do know so far. SCP-3710, that's the robo-dogs, the sled, and their painfully irritating passenger, are known to manifest at random intervals along the route of the Iditarod Trail sled dog race. This is an annual long-distance dog sled racing event that occurs in early March in Alaska. The route usually runs from the state's largest city of Anchorage to the southern Seward Peninsula city of Nome. Upon appearing, SCP-3710 will then chase after a targeted racer taking part in the Iditarod, following them until it is alongside them or at least within vocal range. Now, you might be worried that this anomaly tries to take part in the sled race, or somehow harm the other contenders. While its goal is disrupting the Iditarod, it's not known to cause active harm. Once it catches the attention of another sled racer, then SCP-3710 attempts to persuade the competitor to purchase one of the latest products currently being produced by one of the billionaire's various companies. Of course, if you are participating in an annual dog sled race and suddenly you see what appears to be one of the most famous CEOs in the world pull up beside you in a sled pulled by cybernetically enhanced dogs, you might be compelled to do one of two things. The first being speed up to try and escape him. The other might be to hear him out, to satiate your curiosity if nothing else. But the average participant in the Iditarod typically can't afford one of the more cutting-edge products offered by the billionaire's various companies. So naturally, they typically refuse, because they either don't need or can't pay for something so expensive. This doesn't deter SCP-3710, however. Apparently, the one trait it shares with the person it impersonates is a lack of understanding for the financial status of average everyday people, so it keeps offering until the other sled racer has refused at least three times, sometimes requiring more, to really drive the message home. With that, SCP-3710 typically takes off, stating it isn't interested in negotiating any further, and engages the propulsion devices of its eight robo-dogs and the two on the back of the sled. Of course, these highly dangerous Raptor boosters can cause severe burns, blunt force wind damage, and other environmental hazards to the other racers. The first recorded appearance of SCP-3710 takes place in the year 1995. During the course of the year's Iditarod, the entity makes several attempts to sell ZIP-2 software licenses to the various racers competing in the sledding event. Given that it offers these licenses at the staggering fee of $50,000 each, not one of the participants is interested. Shortly after the conclusion of the Iditarod 95, the SCP Foundation starts looking into the anomaly. They begin by contacting the real deal, Elon Musk himself. When asked about his whereabouts, he tells the Foundation that he was in New York City, over 3,000 miles away from where the Iditarod takes place every year. The Foundation, having confirmed that the entity manifesting during the sled race was, indeed, an imposter, try next to capture the anomaly. This doesn't go well at all. They send out six Foundation operatives, all of them disguised as dog sled racers. SCP-3710 manifests yet again, but manages to evade the six-person team sent to capture it. It flies away by firing up its boosters and thoughtlessly buries the six Foundation agents under an avalanche. However, as we all most likely know by now, the SCP Foundation isn't one for giving up after just one try. They proceed to make numerous attempts to capture and question SCP-3710, including going as far as to administer amnestics to any of the Iditarod competitors who claim to have seen the entity. That way, with their memories wiped, word of the strange sledding salesman can never get out to the public. Whenever it appears during the annual Alaskan sled race, Foundation agents on the site attempt to use specialized tranquilizer rifles to apprehend SCP-3710. These, however, usually don't work, given the anomaly's fondness for just flying away with its RoboDog's boosters or vanishing entirely when it demanifests. But you're probably wondering what happens should someone decide to accept one of SCP-3710's extortionate offers during the race? Can somebody actually purchase an overpriced electric car or a potentially deadly brain chip from the anomaly? 
The Foundation ponders the very same question, and during one of their many containment attempts, is able to get an answer. Agent Cheyenne McCormick is sent undercover to participate in the annual Iditarod Trail Sled Dog Race. Her instructions from the Foundation higher-ups are clear. Should she encounter SCP-3710, she's to reject its first two attempts at selling her anything. But then, the third time it offers, McCormick is told to accept. Armed with a debit card containing $100,000, she sets out on her sled. One key detail is left out. Nobody tells Agent McCormick what SCP-3710-1 looks like. While she's out on the Iditarod, her dogs racing along and pulling her sled behind them through the snow, the agent soon becomes aware of another pack of dogs running up alongside hers. A short few seconds later, and she soon hears a voice hailing her from the other sled. SCP-3710-1 greets her as a valued customer and gives a disjointed opening speech as an introduction to its sales pitch. It begins by talking about doing something important even when the odds are not in your favor. SCP-3710-1 claims brands are just perception and that perceptions can change over time. Then it doubles down its previous statement by stating that brands are just the collective impression of a product. That's when it offers her a brand new Tesla electric car. Confused, the agent questions if SCP-3710-1 is meant to be who she thinks it's meant to be. The entity claims it is, indeed, the one and only highly recognizable businessman. It also states that it would be in violation of SpaceX policy if it wasn't who it claims to be, before then offering the Foundation agent a Tesla for over $200,000. When she rejects the offer and tells the entity she can't afford that, it then lowers the price to $150,000. SCP-3710-1 also claims that when Henry Ford first made cheap, reliable cars available to the public, there were those who rejected this in favor of horses. The agent follows her prior instructions and tells the entity for a second time that the asking price is too expensive. Using presumably much the same justification the real Elon Musk employs, SCP-3710-1 explains that offering a compelling product means charging a premium. However, it then offers Agent McCormick the third, lower price of $50,000. It even makes the lofty promise that she could be driving her new Tesla as early as the following day. Just as she has been told to, the agent accepts the much lower price. As thanks for doing business, the product hawking anomaly includes an additional bonus to her purchase. It says it will give the agent a once-in-a-lifetime add-on, and not one typically seen with other electric car purchases. SCP-3710-1 claims it will give cybernetic rocket propulsion enhancements to both Agent McCormick and her team of sled dogs. It tells her that the first step is to establish something as physically impossible. Then cybernetic surgery can occur. Before the agent can even question what is going on, something happens that causes her to suddenly vanish without a trace. The Foundation is confounded following the loss of contact with Agent McCormick. A team of retrieval operatives is deployed to her latest known location within the area of Alaska where the Iditarod takes place. They follow her last recorded GPS tracker to find no evidence of where she went or what happened to her. Even the dogs that had been pulling her sled are nowhere to be found. Any hope that she'd be found alive and well dissipates the moment that the retrieval team comes across Agent McCormick's abandoned sled, left unattended in the middle of the trail. Beyond the audio recordings of the interaction between the agent and SCP-3710-1, there is only one other piece of evidence to prove that it even took place at all. Foundation agents notice a bank transfer, bearing the exact date of Agent McCormick's untimely disappearance. The amount transferred is $50,000, sent from an SCP Foundation front company to the sales account of Tesla Incorporated. For three whole weeks following the incident, there's no change no sign of the missing agent, and no reappearance of SCP-3710. That is, until a blip is noticed on one of the SCP Foundation's monitors, a tiny blinking spot on a map, highlighting a location so far away that nobody would ever think to even search there. Agent McCormick's GPS locator has reactivated, but she's not in Alaska anymore. Instead, the signal relayed to the Foundation puts her over five and a half thousand miles away, in Tahiti, the Foundation hurries to triangulate her exact position, and a retrieval team is sent out to her coordinates. It looks like she's somewhere off the western coast of the French Polynesian island, in the shallower waters of the Pacific Ocean. The team rushes to the location, hoping that if they make it quick enough, their fellow Foundation operative will still be alive, although we're not certain any of them could predict what they'd actually find. Following the GPS locator, the team discovers a Tesla Model 3, 
a car that isn't due to be released until several months from the time they found it. Immediately, the retrieval experts began to examine the vehicle, searching for any further signs of the missing Foundation agent. And sure enough, they quickly find her. Agent McCormick is alive in the trunk of the electric vehicle, although not exactly in the same state she was in when she disappeared. Much to the horror of those that have discovered her, the agent has undergone severe and invasive cybernetic surgical modification. Anyone with an affinity for that type of enhancement might hope for a mechanical arm that shoots rockets or has hidden blades or maybe a spinal device that can make a person run faster than the human eye can perceive. But Foundation Agent Cheyenne McCormick isn't so lucky. Her entire lower jaw, including her esophagus, has been replaced with a Raptor propulsion device. Whoever is responsible for the mechanical modification of the missing agent had left a handwritten note attached to Agent McCormick's forehead, which read, Thank you for purchasing from Tesla Incorporated. We deeply regret the conditions under which we are forced to return your representative. An accident occurred when they attempted to prevent the agreed-upon dog modification, as stated in Article 1, Subsection 3 of our verbal purchase agreement. Upon purchase, the customer shall seed all dogs in his or her possession for propulsion modification in preparation for SpaceX's excursion to Enceladus. The note then concludes with a link to fill out a customer satisfaction survey. Foundation experts would later discover that this URL posed a cognitohazardous threat. Additionally, the note contained thanks for the agent's contribution of money and dogs towards the Tesla SpaceX Rocket Dog Initiative. After stating he hopes they'll shop with Tesla again, the note is signed with the all-too-familiar name of the company's infamous CEO. The following year, the Iditarod starts up once again. And just like many times before, SCP-3710 makes its usual repeat appearance. But this time, there's a slight difference. Now, a second identical instance of SCP-3710-1 manifests alongside the original, with its own matching rocket-powered sled complete with cybernetically modified dogs. The dog team pulling this new instance's sled matches the description of the dogs that had pulled Agent McCormick's sled a year earlier. But of course, they too have seemingly undergone the same cybernetic surgery to implant them with Raptor propulsion devices. The SCP Foundation's researchers theorize that SCP-3710 manifests during the Iditarod race primarily for two reasons. For one, it's an isolated route through the snowy tundra of Alaska, with not a lot of witnesses, save for the participating sled racers and their dogs. But therein lies the second reason, the dogs. Given the intense physical training these sled dogs undergo, it seems that makes them ideal candidates for SCP-3710's cruel, sadistic, and unapproved cybernetic experiments. As the old adage says, buyer beware. And as a general rule of thumb, we'd recommend not buying anything from someone who claims to be a genius. The flashlight beam casts demonic shadows that twist and shift with the trembling of his hands. It makes the feeling worse, seeing those shadows twitch against the walls like they're somehow alive. But shadows can't be alive, can they? Another noise, a creak that sounds distinctly like the weight of someone's soul against the floorboard. Now the man knows he hasn't been imagining it. The beam of light sweeps over the room towards the source of the noise. To reveal the source of his torment is... Nothing. There's nothing there. And yet every feeling, every instinct, tells him that his eyes are wrong. Listen closer. Someone's here. And yet, there's no one. Not a soul. The man sighs. He swears he thought someone had gotten inside. He decides to double-check, creating more dancing, unsettling shadows with his flashlight as he scans the rest of the living room. Nothing again. Then the kitchen. Still nothing back upstairs to the landing. Nobody but him. And in the bedroom? He's alone again. But he doesn't feel alone. In fact, he feels the opposite, the undeniable presence of someone else there, or something else. He switches the flashlight back off and stays still. There's no point in trying to sleep now. The uncertainty of it all is bound to keep him awake. So he stands there, surrounded by the dark, and the silence, just waiting for the next sign. Another creak, breathing, a footstep, anything. Even in the dark, it's like he can feel the eyes on him. The back of his neck bristles, hair standing to attention like a breath passing over his skin. What if it is? What if it's right there, right behind him? The flashlight is back on in a second as he turns around. The light illuminates the space behind him, and there's still nothing there. 
but despite finding no sign of anyone else in the apartment, despite knowing for certain he's alone, the man doesn't feel alone. It feels like there's someone watching. In fact, it's always felt like there's someone watching. Has this ever happened to you? Of course it has. Most of us, if not all of us, have at one point or another experienced that same sinister sensation. You hear something move, only to see nothing out of place. What sounds like a footstep turns out to be just the foundations of your house settling. And all the while, you can't escape that uncanny and unnerving feeling that somebody's watching you. Could they be across the street, peering in through your window? Or maybe, just maybe, they're inside, right behind you, hiding in the only place you would never look. You might write this off as just paranoia, a primal, self-preserving instinct passed down from our earliest ancestors, going haywire as it keeps a lookout for imminent threats when there are none. But it's not that. Not at all. It's both out there and in your head all around, nearly wherever you go. And it's always watching. They call it causal absent paranoia. At least, that's the official term. If you ever find yourself looking up the definition, then you'll most likely wind up reading words to this effect. The healthy brain overreacting to natural stimulus due to overindulgence, excessive stress, lack of sleep, and other such strains to the mind and body. But that's just the definition that the SCP Foundation wants you to know and it's not hard to see why. After all, it removes that unsettling sense of mystery, the unknown factor of it all. Chalking it up to stress or overactive imagination, it reminds you not to worry and that it's all just your mind playing tricks on you. But it isn't. Your brain is working fine and is, in fact, warning you of danger. And that danger is SCP-3010. The Foundation's research has uncovered that the feeling of being watched stems from something very, very real, an undetectable entity that they have designated SCP-3010-1. You might be better acquainted with it as that brief dash of movement out of the corner of your eye or the noises you can't explain. In other words, the things that go bump in the night. But if you ever get that feeling, like someone else is staring at you, observing you against your will, then that's your best indicator. You're not alone. It's in the room with you. And it's watching. Always watching. It doesn't happen every time. None of us are going around constantly feeling like some unseen entity is watching us. At least, the lucky ones aren't. While manifestations of the entity are somewhat random and inconsistent, the SCP Foundation has determined that certain requirements can first be met in order to deliberately cause SCP-3010-1 to successfully manifest. These specifics relate to the space that a person is currently inhabiting. For starters, anything too small won't work. So that's any tight or cramped spaces, single rooms, or sterile environments that are shut off from the outside world, like hospitals or prisons. Foundation containment cells also fall into this latter category. But anything bigger, particularly in houses or living spaces comprised of at least 500 square meters in terms of floor space, are prime real estate for the entity, SCP-3010-1, especially if the lights are turned down low, if not switched off completely, and if there's only one living person present inside. Now, if you were expecting that the moment you're next home alone, that you could just turn out the lights and summon SCP-3010-1, then you'd be wrong. At any rate, we wouldn't recommend trying it. Little is known about the entity itself. It has hardly anything in the way of physical traits that the Foundation knows about. In terms of where it first came from, why it depends on stalking and observing humans, or even what it wants, there are no answers. The Foundation has, however, learned the following things about SCP-3010-1. For one, it is totally imperceptible. It can't be observed at all not in any perceivable wavelength of light. So put down the thermals and night vision goggles or the UV light, the only surefire way to tell, or rather, guess, where it is at any given time, is after any kind of reactive incident with the entity. Secondly, the Foundation has noticed that SCP-3010-1 interacts differently with human beings who display the symptoms of avoidant disorders. This can include those suffering from social anxiety or inhibition, or who are typically withdrawn, Around a full half of people with these avoidant disorders will not react to scenarios wherein the entity manifests. 
In short, the reactive events caused by SCP-3010-1 often don't affect those with avoidant disorders or at least 50% of those people. However, the half that the entity can interact with often feels the effects of SCP-3010 with a lot more intensity. The unnerving feeling of being watched becomes full-blown inescapable paranoia. As for what exactly SCP-3010-1 looks like, the Foundation is at a loss. Given the entity can't be perceived, it makes getting a witness sketch or a mugshot somewhat tricky. However, there is one thing that the SCP Foundation knows for sure. It does have the limitations of a physical form. This isn't an incorporeal, ethereal ghost that can phase through walls and other solid objects. SCP-3010-1 has a physical presence, and it seems to have an awareness of this. It's for that reason it won't manifest in smaller spaces like single-occupant rooms or particular places with no windows or doors like Foundation containment cells. By avoiding these places, it can't be trapped. SCP-3010-1 remains passively hostile toward human beings, and it will only directly engage a subject when a certain number of set triggers are met. Those that inadvertently cause this to happen find themselves receiving a particularly grim fate. Those who actively seek out or attempt to hunt the entity, especially with the intent to destroy it, are more likely to cause SCP-3010-1 to manifest. Sometimes it's worth trying to ignore the ominous sound of creaking coming from deep within your house rather than going looking for what made it. Anyone spending a prolonged period of time around mirrors is also likely to trigger a manifestation. The same can be said for those in unlit or dimly lit rooms, along with those who endure a long period of isolated, continuous silence, or make any attempt to call anyone else for help. With enough of these factors met, enough space, a lack of lighting, and no more or less than one person in a room or house, SCP-3010-1 will manifest and trigger what is known as a reactive event. This can be achieved by doing anything that increases the adrenaline levels of an isolated person, from creepy noises to the instinctive sensation that comes from being directly watched. Those few who have managed to survive their encounters with the entity have described the symptoms of SCP-3010 coming from behind. They will experience the observation or presence of another being coming from directly behind them. Should they find themselves backed against a wall, they will feel compelled to avoid the nearest window or dark corner. Mirrors are also a cause of major aversion for these victims, often causing those experiencing causal absent paranoia to flee to other rooms without any reflective surfaces present. Anyone currently undergoing the effects of SCP-3010 additionally will not be able to just sleep it off either. The symptoms caused by the impending presence of the entity directly inhibit a person's ability to fall asleep. Not just out of fear, but due to a fundamental function of SCP-3010-1. The entity can manipulate the areas of the human brain that are responsible for the production of melatonin, the induction of sleep states, and the regulation of dreams. The SCP Foundation has discovered this disruption to sleep is caused by a gaseous substance that is dispersed into the local atmosphere. In order to avoid detection by the public, this phenomenon has also been given a medical classification, causal absent paranoia-induced insomnia. Being unable to sleep or escape the feelings of being watched the observed victim will inevitably panic. This is what prompts the reactive event. Usually SCP-3010-1 will manifest through mirrors or windows. Upon manifestation, the entity then proceeds to kill its target. It extracts some vital material from their body, then sucks what is left of them into the breach that it emerged from. When a reactive event has been triggered, SCP-3010-1 deploys a cognitohazardous effect as well. This total memory erasure acts in the way you might expect. Any memories of the targeted person involved in an SCP-3010-1 manifestation will be quickly destroyed. Anyone who might remember them, might think to check on them if they've been missing for a time, will cease to have any recollection of said person. Once the entity has them, it's as if they no longer exist. Of course, this total memory erasure can be circumvented with enough written evidence of a person's existence kept at all times, or with a number of Scranton reality anchors active in the nearby area. Once it has successfully manifested, retrieved a target, and dispatched them, some Foundation researchers believe that SCP-3010-1 enters into a state of stasis. 
This is known to attract reflective surfaces in the surrounding area, making mirrors or windows appear opaque. Symptoms associated with SCP-3010 are also experienced by any and all human beings within a certain radius of the reactive event. So even if you start to feel like there's someone watching you and look over your shoulder to find no one's there, then you could still be in the clear. Although, that might mean someone nearby wasn't as lucky as you were. Following the manifestation, the immediate vicinity of the completed reactive event will undergo a rapid deconstruction. A spatial anomaly takes place, causing the room or location where the target has recently been taken from to expand into a number of tight, dark corridors and various small rooms that will each be filled with mirrors and other reflective surfaces. To date, the Foundation has only recorded a handful of these reactive events, and thankfully, the spatial anomaly that triggers in their wake will normally dissipate after several hours. However, the paranoid symptoms of SCP-3010 will persist in the local area, which has led some researchers to question the validity of the entity going into stasis. There are those who believe it doesn't take breaks. While avoidant personality disorders can either have an extreme repelling or extreme attracting effect on an SCP-3010-1 entity, those with an excessive compulsion for human interaction, in particular, sociopaths, produce a far different and far stranger effect on the entity. Sociopathy is a mental health condition wherein somebody will consistently show that they have a lack of regard for the moral notions of right and wrong. While not all are violent, many sociopaths will often ignore the feelings of others unless they are attempting to manipulate those feelings, for example, appeasing somebody else to make themselves seem more likable and thus garner validation. Interactions between sociopaths and instances of SCP-3010-1 will often lead to the causation of several severe anomalies. One such sociopath has been incarcerated under the SCP Foundation, serving as a member of D-Class, the disposable subgroup of personnel comprised of violent criminals who often find themselves acting as human test subjects for anomalous experiments. This D-Class, D-17729, also known as Mike, is selected for testing involving SCP-3010. The SCP Foundation constructs a specialized dummy house designed to keep the entity trapped. Inside these dummy households, a D-Class is placed, typically one that exhibits extremely reclusive tendencies. They are not told of the existence of SCP-3010-1, nor are they told what the entities are capable of. The D-Class in these houses must each believe that they are well and truly isolated, abandoned alone with the entity. Mike, being one of the D-Class assigned to an SCP-3010-1 containment house, has a video and audio recording device surgically implanted within his body before he awakens inside the dummy house. Confused, he examines his surroundings, searching the area for signs of anyone else living in what he momentarily believes is a real household. He traverses from the bedroom down the hallways towards the staircase, leading from the upper floor down to a foyer. All the while, early symptoms of SCP-3010 begin to surface. Mike checks behind himself as though he's starting to feel like someone is watching him. He tries to convince himself that he's alone, there's nobody behind him. Making a move for the front door, Mike finds he can't open it. He's sealed inside the house. Over the course of the next three hours, he navigates his way across the entire containment cell, occasionally musing to himself. More rapidly, he begins to experience the unnerving symptoms of causal absent paranoia, developing an aversion to the darker areas of the house. A few days later, Mike finds himself keeping all the lights on and deliberately avoiding mirrors. He has to practically argue with himself that he's not afraid of the dark, just in order to go downstairs to the storage room for food. On his eventual way down there, he thinks he spots something in the house with him. Fleeing for his life, he locks himself in the storage room for an entire day, preferring to stay where there is food and light. Within a day, his SCP-3010 has become so bad that he's convinced there's something in the containment house with him. He fashions the shelving units from the storeroom into a makeshift barricade. Following his first whole week in containment with an SCP-3010-1 entity, Mike has stayed put in the storage room. He uses additional light fixtures to keep the room bright and begins tearing wiring out of the walls with the use of a makeshift crowbar. Thanks to his previous experience as an electrical engineer, after nine days, he then creates a makeshift suit covered in light fixtures powered by a portable, hand-crank generator. Donning his light suit, Mike sets out to find and destroy SCP-3010-1, something we know only attracts it more. 
but after searching the containment cell for four hours, Mike falls asleep. This is incredibly rare in the presence of SCP-3010-1 instances, if not impossible. When he reawakens, he not only finds the storage room resupplied by Foundation personnel, but also that the lights have all been put out. Frantically, almost completely unhinged at this point, Mike looks for a weapon to fight any SCP-3010-1 he can find. The next day sees Mike rapidly searching through the containment house for SCP-3010-1 entities. Thinking he's found one, he rushes towards it while exclaiming he has light and for the entity to come out. When he approaches, an SCP-3010-1 reactive event starts, but unlike the other recorded instances, seems to fail. Three mirrors nearby start to produce a low level of light, causing Mike to investigate. The moment he makes contact with one of the mirrors, he screams. The connection to his recording device is lost, and the containment site undergoes a spatial anomaly. In the interest of recovering any evidence of this different reactive event and finding whatever remains of Mike, the SCP Foundation dispatches a team to investigate the ruined containment site. This unit is comprised primarily of the eight members belonging to Mobile Task Force 066, also codenamed Eight Blind Men. Led by their captain, the unit is also overseen by a Foundation researcher named Dr. Obrent. As the team enters the ruins of the containment house, they maintain a clear line of communication with Dr. Obrent via radio. With no idea what will happen once the team is inside, everyone is on high alert, told to look out for cognito hazards or any interruptions of their mental faculties. Upon entry, everything goes quiet. For ten long minutes, there isn't a word from the team. Then comes the eventual report from the captain. The spatial anomaly is in full effect. Dr. Obrent remarks on the long delay of ten minutes, but the captain insists that, from his and the team's point of view, it was only thirty seconds. They quickly reach the conclusion that the spatial anomaly triggered by an SCP-3010-1 reactive event has, this time, resulted in time dilation. The team navigates their way through a repeating series of hallways, finding themselves in a copy of the foyer of the ruined containment site. It's only then that the captain realizes something is wrong. The team is down a man, MTF-066-8, but his men are confused. They tell him that there are only seven members of MTF-066. Dr. Obrent concurs. The captain then points out that MTF-066-6 and MTF-066-7 are also both missing. Once again, the rest of the team insists they've never even heard of those people. Their team has always had five members. It's as if they can't remember, or their comrades have been erased from existence. Eight blind men were rapidly whittled down from five to three to just one. The captain was lost and alone, frantic and paranoid. His remains are never recovered. And before long, the Foundation is forced to accept that their mobile task force, the three blind men, have all been killed in action, with no sign of the missing D-Class, D-17729. But a series of unauthorized addendums have been left on the SCP-3010 file in the Foundation's archive. They seem to have been left by Mike, who recalls his old D-Class designation number. He describes being lost in a series of endless dark halls with only a few small rooms. He says that they probably hate it here because it's a waste of all their eyes. The entity has eyes. They've got eyes in the back of their head. They've got eyes in the back of their mouth. They don't like us, Foundation. But they watch us. They watch us for so long. Why do they hate us, Foundation? Why do they hate me? Why is it so dark? The addendum from Mike ends with him describing his entity coming out of the mirror. He says there's one for every room. Right behind him. Right behind you. Right behind all of us. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-150, Body-Stealing Parasite, Ship of Theseus.